All right, Saskia, go ahead and introduce us. All right, this is um, the second day of our workshop on the open data tools and models from the Allen Institute um, that support computational studies in neuroscience. Um, we're gonna get started in just a couple of minutes. Um, uh, this, yeah, so this is our second day. The first day we spent learning a lot about mostly kind of connectivity data sets um, and seeing examples of some of the work that people have been doing with that. Today, we're gonna focus on um, more of the cell types data. Um, and we have a lot of exciting talks lined up for today. Um, and this, for those of you who aren't familiar with Crowdcast, you can chat um, in the far right. Um, and feel free to make comments and questions, but questions that we wanna ask the speakers um, should go in the ask a question um, link uh, that's a little bit to the left of that um, down on the bottom. So you can um, feel free to post questions there um, that we can then address to the speaker at the end of their talk. All right, I am inviting Stacy on screen for the first talk. So as Stacy's coming up, I will um, introduce her. Stacy is um, senior manager at the Allen Institute. She's been here, I think, a little over 10 years. Um, she's going to be talking about morphoelectric transcriptomic cell types in the mouse visual cortex, telling us about um, using patch seq data to define these um, morphoelectric transcriptomic cell types in the inhibitory cells in the mouse visual cortex, talking about the data, how you can find it. Um, and I think a little bit of some new work about looking at the same morphoelectric transcriptomic cell types, but in, in excitatory cell types as well. So welcome, Stacey. Thank you, Saskia. Um, let me just try to see the, if I can get my screen set up here. Um, okay. Does that look okay? When you're ready, go into full screen and then we should be seeing your slides. Okay. We're seeing the presenter view. Okay, got it. I cannot, I meant to test that with you. Um, great. Um, there. There we go. How's that? Okay, well, thanks, Saskia, uh, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I'm excited to be here to talk about our most recent cell types work. Um, so cells are the fundamental building blocks of the brain, and to understand the brain, we need to understand the component cells. Since the beginning of neuroscience, thanks to the work of Santiago, Ramon, E. Cajal, we've known that there are many different shapes of cells in the brain, suggesting that there are many different types of cells. Um, since then, there's been a ton of work done to test this hypothesis and to describe the different types of neurons, not just their shape, but also their electrophysiological, molecular, and functional properties, as well as how they're distributed throughout the brain and connected to one another. Um, with, the, with advances in single cell transcriptomics, Basilicatastic, Hong Kui Zhang, and our colleagues and, and at the Allen Institute have been able to sequence the transcriptomes of thousands of dissociated individual neurons in primary visual cortex and ALM. And by using transgenic mouse lines to target these neurons, we are able to ensure that we sample the broad population of neurons within these brain regions. All major subclasses of inhibitory and excitatory neurons were identified with increased diversity in the number of types within each subclass, such as uh, Pavel Buman and somatostatin, um, and as compared with previous studies. Um, for a total of 117 neuronal transcriptomic types, or T-types, as I'll refer to them throughout the talk. Uh, this approach allowed us to describe cortical cell types based on gene expression at an unprecedented depth and breadth, but a major open question was how these transcriptomic types related to cortical cell types described 
using other method methods such as those that I mentioned from call. So in a parallel study at the Institute, we used uh, a patch, the patch clamp method to fill and record from thousands of visual cortical neurons, which allowed us to describe the diversity of cells in this brain region along a different axis uh, based on their morpho-electric properties. Um, with this analysis, uh, we found 39 morpho-electric or ME types which implied a uh, greater molecular diversity than was observed based on morphoelectric properties alone. Uh, by using the same transcriptomic, uh, sorry, excuse me, the same transgenic mouse lines uh, used in the transcriptomic studies, we were able to indirectly link transcriptomic and morphoelectric types and find general agreement, uh, particularly at subclass level. But how, how well ME properties and transcriptomic properties agreed, um, basically how to solve the correspondence problem between the two, between the three modalities remained to be addressed and would require a different method. Um, so before I get into how we solve that problem, uh, I'd like to point to you to our website where all of these data are freely available. Here I'm just showing the cell feature search page uh, at the Allen Institute website where the morphoelectric data can be sorted and viewed as well as downloaded as a, an NWB file and uh, for the EFIS and SWC file for the morphology uh, to be used in your own analysis. So to solve the correspondence problem between the two taxonomies, we utilized the patch-seq method developed by Andreas Talias um, and others to extract morphological, electrophysiological, and transcriptomic properties from each cell and to establish a robust pipeline for single-cell multimodal feature analysis. Uh, this pipeline includes a standardized, efficient whole cell patch clamp protocol um, with uh, feature uh, standardized feature extraction. We use Cree lines to target subclass and type specific neuron populations, um, as well as um, uh, unlabeled cells to ensure that we get a broad coverage of uh, types of neurons in the visual cortex. And then we fill the cells with biocytin during the patch clamp recording. Um, for the transcriptomics, we extract the nucleus and cytosol uh, for single cell RNA sequencing with the SmartSeq uh, method. And we developed a framework for matching, uh, for mapping patch-seq cells to the facts-based or dissociated cell-based cell -based taxonomy. Um, each cell is stained, each slice is stained for biocytin and DAPI, which is then used for uh, layer drawings and then mapping the cells to our common coordinate framework that Lydia talked about yesterday. Um, Biocytin filled cells are then imaged uh, in 3D with a 63X uh, uh, objective, and then morphological reconstructions are, are generated from uh, the cells that have uh, high quality uh, morphology within the slice. And then a standard set of morphological features are extracted from the excitatory that based on uh, whether the cell is excitatory or inhibitory. Um, so an important, an important first step in this pipeline was to create a reliable method for mapping cells collected via PatchSeq to the dissociated cell transcriptomic taxonomy described in the TASIC et al. 2018 paper. Uh, Fahima uh, Baftizeda Bagal, um, I'm sorry Fahima, was able to do this using the most differentially expressed genes uh, between cells, uh, bootstrapping and KL divergence to yield T-types with consistent uh, mapping between the two data sets. So for our first study using the PatchSeq method, which is, which is in revision at cell, we focused on GABAergic cortical neurons. Um, and uh, we, let's see, um, 
in part because they, their morphology is well, because they have um, a high diversity and they have morphologies that are particularly well preserved in the slice compared to excitatory neurons, which often lose their, their long range projections in, in a slice. So here I'm showing violin plots of marker gene expression from cells collected with the two different methods. Um, uh, you can see that the uh, that the uh, violin to the left is the dissociated coming from the dissociated cells, and on on the right is the patch seek cells. And um, the pattern of gene expression within and across T types is very consistent for most genes. Um, but between the two methods, though we do see some additional contamination and dropout with the patch seek method. Um, but T-types identified by the two methods also have similar distri distribution patterns with respect to the cortical layers. And then um, combine these two analyses give us the confidence that we're getting meaningful mapping results. Um, Mapping all patch seek neurons to the common coordinate framework or the CCF, uh, we reveal the additional insights about transcriptomic types, namely that their somas have very specific depth and layer distribution patterns, suggesting that this is an important variable in defining transcriptomic types. Uh, LAMP5 cells and VIP cells tend to either be located superficially or span the full depth of the cortex um, like these SNCG, this SNCG subclass. Um, and then SSC, SST types tend to, SST or somatostatin types tend to either span two to three layers um, or to be restricted to layer five or to have a, a border crossing phenotype. Um, and uh, P-valve T-types have this clear stair-step pattern indicating their depth dependence. We were also able to visualize the distribution of the different transcriptomic types with respect to each other and the cortical boundaries within the CCF. Other than depth, we don't see any clear spatial patterns emerging. However, I am intrigued by uh, the clusters of cells that we see for some transcriptomic types compared to others that appear to be uh, more, more evenly distributed uh, across V1. Um, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of more dedicated spatial transcriptomic studies. So similarly, uh, we see diverse electrophysiological signatures for the different transcriptomic types as demonstrated by these responses to positive and negative current steps. UMAPs created based on sparse principal components of electrophysiological properties provide a simplified view of the relationship among cells. And we see that fast spiking parvalbumin cells over here in red, um, and uh, late spiking LAMP5 cells uh, over here in pink are well separated. And then if we look at how different electrophysiological properties are re represented across this space, we can see that spike width and sag also display clear spatial relationships. When we look at where individual T-types are represented on the EFIS U map, um, I'm showing some examples over here. We find examples of types with very tight distributions like parvalbumin TPBG and, and Viper2, uh, and those with wider spread such as this VISP, CRISPOLD, KCNE4, and um, even the SST CHOTL. But overall, T-types have fairly consistent but frequently overlapping EFIS properties. So uh, T-types, as mentioned, have clear depth and layer signatures. And when we look at their morphological and dendrite and axon laminar distribution patterns, as you can see here to the right of my morphological examples, um, uh, 
we see that they also have quite unique branch distribution patterns uh, across and then and sometimes within molecular subclasses. So LAMP5 neurons, uh, three examples are shown up here. They have neurogliaform-like morphologies that are either dominantly located in layer one, as in uh, this T-type, or that have a dominant layer two, three axonal innervation pattern. Uh, so VIP neurons, if we come down here, we have six different examples of T-types with, uh, with that map to different VIP types. They have more of a nar narrow profile, frequently with a descending axon, um, sometimes that goes all the way up to layer one. Um, we, we found that uh, SST neurons have surprisingly diverse morphologies with multiple variants of Martinotti-like uh, layer one projecting and non-Martinotti-like axonal profiles. Parvalic Buman neurons, so here's some examples of those Martinotti-like profiles and then non-Martinotti-like profiles over here. And then uh, Parvalic Buman neurons tend to be more layer restricted uh, in terms of their axon and dendrite distribution patterns with the exception of the, the TPBG again and the Relin TAC1 where we see some inter or translaminar crossing axons. Um, so these are relatively new analyses that Nathan has put together to demonstrate the relation, Nathan Gowans has put together to demonstrate the relationship between transcriptomic types and morphoelectric types. So to define, to define morphoelectric types, he performed an unsupervised clustering analysis and then compared the relationships for consi to consistently mapped T-types. Uh, from the confusion matrix, you can see that based on the diagonal, there is a reasonable agreement between these two different classifications, though in general, ME types tend to be split across multiple T types. So in order to uh, dig into this relationship a bit further and establish a way of assigning types based on all three modalities, he created a graph-based analysis that measured the relationships among ME types and T types. Through this analysis, he was able to identify 27 different MET types that had coherent morphological, electrophysiological, and transcriptomic properties. In this river plot, you can see the relationship between T-types and MET-types. Um, and you can see that most T-types go into a single MET-type, but small groups of T-types also merge um, uh, based on similarities in ME properties. When we test our ability to predict T-types or MET-types based on single or multiple data modalities using a supervised random forest classifiers, we see that the best results come from using at least two modalities and predicting MET-types. Um, at the subclass level, we do get um, greater than 90% accuracy, as you can see over here, but using EFIS properties alone, we only have 60% accuracy. And uh, we do even worse with morphology with close to 40% accuracy at predicting T-types, um, though the confusions are different for EFIS and, and morphology. And then using uh, both electrophysiological and morphological properties, we have a slight improvement in predicting T-types. Uh, but then if we use both M and E properties to predict our MET types, then we get uh, closer to 80% accuracy, though we have fewer types to predict. So that has to be taken into consideration. Um, when we look at SST MET types, uh, we, we, we have, have 13 of them, and we see that they have distinct gene expression, axonal innervation patterns, and electrophysiological properties. There are several different Martinotti-like phenotypes, either with a dominant layer one projection as in SST MET type three, or a layer one, layer five split in a, a T-shaped uh, Martinotti-like morphology. Uh, 
as you can see for types six and seven, though they have slight differences in, in how their uh, axons are distributed with respect to layer five. Um, Stacey, we also you've got have about 10 minutes, just so you know. Okay, thank you. We also have a, a layer four dominant um, uh, SST met type in addition to multiple uh, non martinotti like types that have uh, predominantly innervate the deeper layers and have uh, much less of a projection up to layer one. Um, so parvalbumin met types are primarily distinguished by their laminar position, um, as you can see here, uh, when we look at these axon, uh, this average axon uh, histograms. And then uh, we also see morphological differences between uh, chandelier cells and then the range of fast spiking basket cell types. So if we uh, look at our uh, LAMP5, SNCG, and VIP MET types, we see that we have two different LAMP5 MET types, both with neo neurogliaform cells, uh, mostly found in layer one and layer two, three for MET type one. And then MET type two is this deeper um, cell that mostly uh, contains the LHX6 um, gene cells that have expressed the LHX6 gene. Uh, and then the SNG, SNCG met types are distributed throughout the cortical depth and are an uh, interesting type that uh, resembles the CCK basket cells in terms of their gene expression. And they also have properties, uh, morphological properties of basket and bipolar and bitefted cells. The VIP met types have bipolar bitefted morphologies with variations in laminar positions, uh, dendrite shape, and the distribution of axonal uh, innervation patterns, um, interestingly with either an absence or a presence of a projection to layer four. So um, from these analyses, we think that we have met, that our met types give us meaningful descriptions of inhibitory cell types in visual cortex. Um, uh, so uh, before I uh, get into excitatory neuron, MET types or transcriptomic types. Uh, I just wanted to mention that the data used in these analyses can also be accessed through our Allen Institute website with instructions about how to download the raw data from other public data repositories, including NEMO, Dandy, and the Brain Image Library. And a more sophisticated viewer and direct data access will be included in our own website in the fall. So for the last couple slides here, I'd like to just switch gears to give you a brief update on our excitatory patch seek data. So we know already from analysis of retrogradely labeled cells in the TASIC et al. paper, that there are numerous excitatory T-types that are well separated based on their major projection target. For example, uh, the intratelencephalic or IT projecting neurons um, seen here. Oh gosh, I had some weird formatting stuff going on. And the uh, PT projecting neurons, which you can see um, mostly here. And then from our ME or uh, paper, we know that excitatory neurons have very similar electrophysiological uh, properties uh, across. The, the class, but display a greater morphological diversity based on their uh, dendritic morphology, which also aligns with projection target phenotype based on previous literature. But how well excitatory T types and ME, ty and ME types correspond um, had yet to be determined. Again, I'm having some formatting problems here where I have a U map that should be showing a um, uh, T types color coded by their their um, their their T type color, um, but it didn't. It's not showing up here. But um, if we, uh, based on a large data set of 1,900 excitatory patch seek neurons, uh, where we have morpho 
electric and transcriptomic properties from the same cells. Uh, and then we used FAHIMA's mapping to assign T-type. We can then see the distribution of T-types with respect to the EFIS UMAP for this data set. In this case, you're going to have to rely on the, the subclass labels over here. But we see that there is a large, uh, there are large, mostly non-overlapping subregions occupied by projection target subclass. Um, it mostly breaks out into different geographical regions here for T-types, um, but we, with uh, layer five PTs uh, splitting out into a, a, a thumb over here. Um, but then if we look at the morphological diversity across layer five T-types, we uh, again see subclass differences in terms of apical dendrite shape. And over here I have uh, average dendrite histograms to show the different um, phenotypes. And we can see in the individual examples, as well as the apical laminar distribution histograms, that the thin tufted IT neurons uh, and the thick tufted PT neurons look quite different. Um, there also appears to be some intriguing differences between T types within the IT subclass uh, shown here um, with T types that seem to be enriched for layer five cells that have dendrites that span the entire cortex as seen with this type and others that are enriched for double apicals and that's seen here. Um, uh, I'm not showing it here, but excitatory T-types, particularly within subclass, like inhibitory neurons, often have a strong depth dependence, and that's recently been shown uh -oh, uh, by Ed Calloway's lab to be closely tied to connectivity within visual areas. And I'm very excited to dig into this, the relationship between local morphology and T-type for this data set and begin defining excitatory MET types. Okay, so I'm moving on to my summary slide here. Um, so using our large mouse visual cortex inhibitory neuron patch seek data set, we're able to describe the enemy properties of um, T inhibitory T-types. They have uh, select selective depth, sublaminar and laminar profiles and distinct axonal innervation patterns, particularly for the SST met types. We've been able to strengthen the link between T-types and previously described cell types in the field. And then we've defined a set of 27 inhibitory met types with coherent properties in all three modalities. Um, so our future work will be focused on describing the ME properties as, of excitatory T-types and um, such as this guy I'm showing here. And then uh, we're really, um, looking forward to trying to link um, T types to our other data uh, data sets that we're collecting here at the institute, um, such as our full morphology data set, and then we want to identify cell type specific circuits by linking T types to the EM data that Nunu and Forrest will be talking about later in the talk. And to do this, we'll be using uh, the local morphology. And then um, as we uh, look to the more distant future, we are also beginning efforts to uh, patch cells in other cortical regions and, uh, and, in, and even in subcortical regions. And we're interested in investigating the principles of cell type specific connectivity uh, across the entire brain. And then I'll end with this slide just to show that this is, um, there is a huge number of contributors to this project um, in some uh, particular standouts are Nathan Gowans, who is the first first author on the paper that I spent most of my time talking about, um, and Jim Berg, who runs the Electrophysiology Core, along with Gabe Murphy, Agata, Brian, and Tim also were major contributors to, um, to this work. And uh, on the transcriptomic side, Fahima, as I mentioned, as well as Zijen Yao, Basilica Tasik, 
Kim Smith runs the um, RNA sequencing core, and then Oiga Sumbal also contributed to um, uh, how we decided to analyze these data. And then in my own group, um, I have to give a shout out to Rachel Daly, who is uh, absolutely essential in um, uh, pushing data through our morphology pipeline. Uh, Chen Q Lee was uh, particularly important for our morphoelectric uh, cell type characterization efforts. And then um, my morphology team, Alice, David, Grace, Lauren, and uh, Matt, Claire, and then Julie um, as a supporter. Uh, and then leadership the, through the leadership of Hong Kui Zhang, Ed Lean, and Christoph Koch, as well as many others at the Institute. So I'd like to say thank you to them, as well as our founder, uh, Paul G. Allen. And uh, with that, I will end. Great. Thank you, Stacey. That was wonderful. Um, we got a couple of questions here that I can read off for you. Um, I'm going to start with the second one. Um, when you look at inhibitory MET types, how much does the soma position correlate with variation in the axonal laminar density patterns? That is, does having a soma that is higher or lower within a layer <clears throat> cause apparent differences in axon innervation patterns, or does it appear irrelevant after you restrict yourself to MET type? Um, no, the, the soma depth is hugely important. If, as you could see from some of the, from our uh, average axon histograms, that uh, there's, regardless of the cell type, there's typically an increase in the, the local or the somatodendritic uh, innervation um, pattern. And then, but some T types will also have a uh, a much larger uh, um, laminar innervation in, in another layer, either in addition to or in replacement of that, that local innervation. There's a SST um, CalB2 PD LIM5 type. That's uh, what I think of as the most classic version of a Martinotti cell where it, uh, the, the layer one projection is actually more dominant than that local innervation. But, but um, yeah, soma depth is, is hugely important. All right, um, <clears throat> for the second question, um, is there enough data to distinguish the layer four and layer two, three excitatory types um, do the different layer two, three excitatory T types map onto distinct ME types, or is it too early to tell? It, can I tell apart the, the layer two, three and layer four T types, and then do the different ME types, are they distinguished at the, by, for transcriptomic types? And transcriptomically, is that what? Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's this a single layer four transcriptomic type, um, and that we we do see that that is, that the me phenotype aligns with the transcriptomic type. Um, for the layer two three neurons, there is less of a correspondence between me properties and t types, and so um, and one of those layer th two three types has. Um, some additional activity dependent gene expression. And so we think about whether it's a reflection of a state versus a type. Um, but, you know, with the excitatory neurons, that's why we will also uh, be really interested in looking, trying to link it to their long range projections and, and, and actually their local connectivity through the EM data set to see if that resolves some of the differences that we see between ME properties and T. Great. Well, thank you again for a wonderful talk. Um, <clears throat> we will move on now to Tim. Um, I think if he's getting set up. Um, Tim is going to be talking about probing synaptic signaling with open physiology uh, data sets and tools. Um, he's going to be describing the synaptic physiology data. This is one of my favorite data sets at the Institute that I have had no involvement in. Um, but I think it's really cool, so I'm excited mm -hmm. for this talk. Um, he's going to tell us about the data, why we're collecting it, um, what it is, how to access it, and kind of news about um, upcoming data releases. So welcome, Tim. Good morning, everyone. Let me share my screen. Uh, 
All right, can everyone see the slides? Thank you, Saskia. Uh, good day, everyone. So as Saskia said, I'm Tim Jarski, and I'm part of a team that's dedicated uh, to the physiological characterization of synapses in the cortex. <clears throat> There we go. Um, our work um, complements the structural measures that you're going to hear about next in Forrest uh, Coleman's talk. Uh, these measures of connectivity that they make uh, anatomically with and, and about synapse properties, we complement those with physiological measures of strength and short-term plasticity. And we link those physiological uh, measures to cell types. Another data set that our work nicely complements is the cell type work that you just heard about, where the intrinsic properties are related to cell class, and in that case, uh, tra even transcriptomic cell type. Here are a few uh, data use cases that we imagine uh, external users uh, could use our data for. So the, the one we would... Uh, be most uh, excited that people used our data for was to parameterize bio biologically realistic models, uh, to in, in particular to investigate the impact of short-term plasticity, short-term synaptic plasticity on circuit function. Um, there's other ways you can explore our data. So for example, if you're interested in higher order circuit motifs, you can pool across experiments to investigate the, uh, for example, the relationship between um, uh, recurrent direct recurrent synaptic connectivity and uh, unidirectional synaptic connectivity. And lastly, uh, what about synapse types? Are there are there in fact different synapse types? Uh, for example, in the past, Henry Markham has argued that there are facilitating synapses, depressing synapses, and synapses that both depress and facilitate. Is this is this are those three distinct categories, or in fact, are do all are, is do synapses exist on a gradient? <clears throat> so synaptic signaling, as I have already indicated, is much more than binary on and off. They can be electrical or chemical synapses, inhibitory or excitatory, strong, weak, fast, slower, and so on. And our project is focused on characterizing cell classes based on these parameters. And so before I go any further, I wanna make sure we're all on the same page. So first, a synapse is a connection between two neurons. We, we call these the presynaptic and postsynaptic cells. Electrical spikes in the presynaptic cell can evoke <clears throat> tiny electrical blips in the postsynaptic cell. This is the entire basis of communication between neurons. We call these postsynaptic potentials or PSPs. In almost every case, the presynaptic cell determines whether the postsynaptic potential is inhibitory or, or excitatory. Finally, the strength of a synapse is both stochastic and dynamic. The amplitude of, of these PSPs change randomly from spike to spike, and even the average strength changes rapidly over time. This gives the synapse the ability to do much more than just relay signals. They actually process and transform those signals as well. I'll give you two simple examples. Looking on very short time scales, we find that some synapses, are, in, in some synapses, a rapid train of presynaptic spikes causes the response to, to, grad, to become gradually stronger. We call this facilitation. And with some synapses, we have the opposite effect. The PSPs become gradually weaker. We call this short-term depression. For simplicity, I want to stop there, but of course, I'm only scratching the surface. <clears throat> we measure synaptic properties using multi-patch electrophysiology. One of our eight-channel rigs is shown here. You may also note the image on the monitor <clears throat> with neurons expressing two different reporters. We use transgenic mice that express unique reporters in combinations of cell classes, two cell classes at a time. This enables the targeting of specific neuronal populations, for example, VIP to SST connections. In human surgical specimens, we of course don't have transgenic tools, and so our, sa our sampling is much more biased to excitatory cell populations. So why are we producing this data? 
After all, isn't there a large number of articles already out there where synaptic connectivity is physiologically characterized? Here is a matrix put together from the literature by Yazan Bele and published in Neuron in 2020 as part of a larger study. It nicely demonstrates where connectivity estimates exist as a function of layer and cell type. These, um, these values are pulled from a wide variety of different sources, multiple species, multiple cortical regions, often very different experimental conditions, and in many case, cases, even just edu educated guesses based on morphological constraints. This particular matrix shows connection probability, but if we try to fill the same matrix with synaptic strength or kinetics or any properties that describe short-term plasticity, the data become much more sparse. Even when we do have data to compare, it's usually not clear how to implement a model from these values. So here, this matrix element has a connection probability of about 0.85. At what distances were these measured, measured, or what holding potentials or solutions? So this is a major motivator for our project, to fill as much of this matrix as possible with data that are collected in a consistent way under standardized conditions. We provide this data freely so that folks like yourselves can build large-scale biophysically realistic models of the cortex. So what data types produce what, data, what are the data types produced by the Synaptic Physiology Project? The most commonly reported, but perhaps the one in which physiological methods are most ill-suited to estimate is connection probability. Here is a view of the connectivity data. Uh, allow me a moment to help you understand what you're looking at. On the right here is, a is the mouse connectivity matrix. <clears throat> where the presynaptic cells are organized along the columns and the postsynaptic cells in rows. The matrix is subdivided by layer, so layer two, three, layer four, layer five, layer six. <clears throat> Within each layer, we probe one or two excitatory cell classes and three of the major inhibitory classes. So in each layer, you see parvalvin, SST, and VIP. And here in layer five, we have two uh, excitatory classes, so the extra telencephalic and the intertelencephalic. <clears throat> Within each element is the number of probed connections over the number of found connections, and the color encodes the connection probability. To view data in a matrix format like you see here, you can check out our matrix analyzer GUI and the link shown here at the bottom. So this is a huge amount of very detailed data about the connectivity in the circuit, and importantly, the coverage is increased relative to the previous literature. The human data set is pretty modest by comparison, but it has some interesting results, aside from being perhaps the only open data set of its kind on human tissue. So you can imagine, instead of coloring each cell by connection probability, you could also look at synaptic strength or latency, or any of the other properties that we have measured. In fact, here is a compact version of the matrix in the previous slide showing latency instead of connection probability. <clears throat> to its right are some representative traces showing the, me the minimum, medium, and maximum excitatory and inhibitory latencies. Further to the right, you can see the latency histograms for all the synapses merged into two broad classes, excitatory and inhibitory. You'll note that the excitatory and inhibi that the excitatory synapses generally have a longer latency than excitatory, sorry, excuse me, the excitatory to excitatory synapses generally have a longer latency than the excitatory to inhibitory synapses. In this matrix, in our, gener in our data set at this time, all excitatory to excitatory connections are recurrent connections, that is, connections restricted to the same layer and the same excitatory subclass. Here is a similar plot showing the time constant of the rising phase of the postsynaptic potential. Again, there are some interesting patterns that stand out. Excitatory connections onto parvalvin cells rise most quickly. We interpret bands in the column, like this, as a property of the postsynaptic cell subclass. 
Whereas banding in the rows, like the long rise time of somatostatin postsynaptic potentials are considered to be a feature of the presynaptic cell subclass. This plot and the previous, previous plot give you a sense of how quickly the different synapse types can influence their synaptic targets. But what about their amplitude, sometimes alternatively called strength? We have released two measures of strength, the, re the resting state strength, that is when a synapse is fully recovered, there hasn't been a presynaptic action potential in at least 15 seconds. Note the big difference in resting state amplitudes between excitatory for connections from excitatory cells to parvalbumin cells versus excitatory connections onto somatostatin neurons. <clears throat> Whereas the 90th percentile amplitude shows that under certain conditions, the strength of the excitatory to somatostatin connection can be similar to the excitatory to, par to, parvalbumin, uh, to parvalbumin connection. To understand why this is, I think it's going to be helpful to view the short-term plasticity matrix in the next slide. But before I do that, I want to point out that we are deliberately avoiding comparisons of synaptic strength between excitatory and inhibitory synapses. I think this is a critical point. We do not contrast excitatory and inhibitory strength because the strength is determined by artificial experimental conditions that set the excitatory and inhibitory driving forces. Please keep this in mind when using our data. It's safe to make strength comparisons within a class, but not between a class. Okay, so here is the short-term plasticity matrix. And in this case, I'm showing data uh, gathered at 50 stimulation frequencies of 50 Hertz. So we get this data from inducing multiple repeats of a train of 12 action potentials, again, at 50 Hertz in the presynaptic cell. On the right, you can see some representative experiments where the gray dots show the amplitudes, the gray dots here show <clears throat> show the amplitudes of individual postsynaptic potentials, and the black line shows the mean. On the top is an example of a depressing synapse. So it gets weaker with each successive action potential. In the middle is a facilitating synapse, and on the bottom is a synapse that neither strongly uh, facilitates or depresses. So from this data, we can calculate a measure of short-term plasticity as shown at the bottom, at the bottom here. And you can see that uh, excitatory to, so here, you can see that the excitatory to SST connections, in fact, strongly facilitate, which is why their 90th percentile strength is sim similar to the excitatory to parvalbumin's 90th percentile strength when their resting strength was not. Okay, so that, um, so you can also query our data to determine how quickly a synapse can recover. Here you can see that most synapses are not fully recovered after 250 milliseconds of rest. Our data contains larger recovery in intervals out to four seconds. So that's a summary of the data types in our data release. How can one access this data? So in this section, I'm going to review how to access our landing page, two ways to access the data, and a brief overview of setting up our uh, API. Our landing page can be accessed through the Allen Institute for Brain Science main landing page, brainmap.org. When our data release was new, it could be found at the top, but we recently had a new set of projects undergo updates. So now it's located towards the bottom of the page. You'll find it among the connectivity matrix projects and our data portal describes what's in our data set, how it was acquired, how to access the data and where to get more information. Tim, you've got about 10 minutes. Perfect, thank you. There are two main ways to access our data. You can do it through MyBinder or the Python application program interface. MyBinder is an ephemeral service that, that is 
that if it is left unused for several minutes, the server will shut down. It's a great way to play with our code and requires no technical skills to get up and running. You may note that when you're attempting to use the service, it can take a, up to a couple minutes to start the server, but it really shouldn't take more than longer than this. If it does, I recommend trying Fire, a F Firefox browser if you're not already using it. After the server is spun up, you can explore some of the Jupyter Notebooks we've pre-populated the server with. It's a really nice way to get a sense of how the code is working. But again, as I said before, it's not a place you want to do your own analysis. For that, you'll want to install our API. <clears throat> Setting up the Python environment, including the AI SynFizz repository, is straightforward, especially if you're already familiar with Python. One thing to keep in mind that, that if the AI SynFizz environment isn't your base environment, you'll need to activate it with each use. The error messages that are returned when you attempt to run our tools without activating the environment really are not any help. So it's important that you remember this little, this little detail. I've in fact uh, made this mistake a few times myself. Okay, so you'll need to download the data set to use with our API and you have three choices, each offering a, each choice has a different sort of data resolution. And that's sort of summarized here in that table. The main feature of the large uh, database that makes it so much bigger is that it includes time series for every presynaptic spike and corresponding postsynaptic recording. So if you're interested in you know, doing your own analysis of raw data traces, this is what you'll need. But if you're, in fact, you know, interested in using the features that we've already extracted from these time series, you don't need the large um, database. Another thing I want to point out, though, is that if you are interested in this full database, you don't need to worry about, you know, the, the download failing and then having to restart the download from the beginning. The server will handle this intelligently and can uh, start off, a, start, renew the download where it left off previously. Okay, so those are our, th our three databases, and you know, um, the the small one is the one we use in the my in, in the my binder, and um, I, I recommend starting with either the small or, or, the, or the medium uh, before at attempting to download the, the full database. All right, so our database is organized into a series of related tables, and here are the most commonly used tables. And the blue lines are showing the relationships between those tables. We have a new database in pre-release that has two new tables from the, the that has two new tables, an intrinsic table. So these this table contains many of the same features that you see in this in the cell types project. So now you can if you wish, you can separate our cell classes, our Cree cell classes, you know, for example, SST, by, by these additional properties. So if you could, for example, separate SST cells from low, uh, those with a low Rio base and those with a high Rio base. We've also added a gap junction table. So in addition to characterizing chemical synaptic transmission, we now have electrical synaptic transmission in our database. Here's the full list of data, database tables. Um, we describe the content of our tables in the documentation, but I find a really great way to explore the tables is with the open source tool, uh, PG Admin. And this is, of course, it's open source, so it's freely available. And it's a nice way to view the content of our tables to get a sense of uh, what's there and, and um, how the data is structured. Okay. so. Let's imagine you've um, install, installed the API and you want to carry out a general database query. I, I'm showing some example code of that here. And I just wanted to walk through this example to show hopefully how, how simple it is to run a, a query. OK, so in this case, 
I want to query uh, these tables, the pair table, the cell table, the morphology table, the experimental table, the resting state fit, the synapse, and the dynamics. So many tables at once. Those are the tables I want. And now I need to describe the relationship between those tables with these join statements. So each time I'm telling, at each point I'm telling, um, I'm explicitly stating sort of which which sort of uh, column in table in the table is equivalent to the column in the table I want to make the relationship across. So in this case, the post cell ID in the cell table is the same ID as in the pair table, and I do this for each pairing now. So uh, and 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 one important point here is that in this pairing, I'm relating to the post cell ID whereas I could have also related to the pre-cell ID. So again, this pre and post, right? That's the jargon I introduced earlier for pre-synaptic cell and post-synaptic cell. So uh, depending on what, you know, you're, whether you're interested in the pre and the post, you need to uh, select uh, the, how, how to do the joining. Okay, so we've done this. We've now joined all these tables, but I don't want all the data from all of these tables. I want to filter it. And so that's this next step here. And so in this case, I'm filtering for mouse data. I'm not uh, selecting the human data. So I'm selecting our pre-production data and our production data. I only want all the pairs where that have a synapse. And um, I only, in this case, I only want all the excitatory synapses. I'm not interested in the inhibitory synapses. I'm also only interested in these in the pairs that have a dendritic uh, morphology associated with them, and in particular, the dendrite type. So for all of our uh, cells, we've attempted to characterize the degree of spininess. So it's either uh, aspiny, uh, partially spiny, or spiny. So I wanted this call to exist in the, the dendrite type call to be present in all the da data that I return from this query. And finally, in this case, I'm interested in only in SST cells. So I'm specifying that here. So this is how you can select uh, specific data from the tables using the filter. So now, now basically, once you've run this query, you're now in a Python environment and you're interacting with the objects that SQ Alchemy returns which are generally treated as uh, as tuples. And it, it's where you want to go from here, you know, just is, is normal Python programming. So I hope this was a helpful example of how to access, uh, to create a, a general query of our SQLite database. So in addition to uh, releasing the, the data and the API, we also um, share our code for acquisition. So for those that are interested in, you know, recreating our experiments, perhaps in other areas of the brain, you can download some of our acquisition tools, uh, for example, ACQ4 or MES. And then also our data is stored in the NWB format, Neurodata Without Borders. And if you're interested in learning more about that format, you can uh, visit this website at the shown at the bottom here. All right, so with that, I want to thank uh, Paul Allen for his vision, encouragement, and, and, and support. But I also want to take a moment to thank the many members of the Allen Institute spread across several teams that have helped uh, create this data and generate this data release. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. That was really awesome. Um, I've got a couple questions here in the, uh, the question window that I can read for you. Um, again, I'm going to start from the back at the bottom and work my way up. But um, so a question um, that connection probability is a measure that is very sensitive to both sample size and distances between tested pairs of cells. Um, with that in mind, do you have any advice for modelers who would like to use distance-dependent connection probabilities extracted from your measurements of connected over total tested? Also, given the understandably more limited human data set, can you speak to any obvious noticeable differences between the mouse and human recordings? 
Thank you for those uh, very nice questions. And the, the first one is, I, th I think, a particularly important one. I, I tried to touch on that a, a little bit at the beginning about um, the challenges of using physiological data to generate connectivity estimates. Um, I would, the, the first weakness, the reason I said that in particular is usually um, it's really challenging to generate the sample size uh, necessary to create confidence, confident connectivity estimates. Um, but having said that, our, our sample sizes in many cases are getting sufficient to make reasonable estimates. And in, in some cases you can see that there are, um, you know, obvious differences in the connectivity rates as a function of distance. So the first thing I'll say is, you know, in our tables, we store the, the intersomatic distances. In fact, we store the sort of the X, Y, Z positions of all the somas that in, in of, of the somas in each pair. So you can use that to um, determine to sort of uh, to determine the distance between each cells and express that in any way you want. So you could, you know, express it in terms of like distance within the layer, distance across layers, or you could use the, you know, just the hypotenuse as to as as the distance measure. So that information is there in, in the pair table. So you can express the connectivity as a function of distance. The second important thing I want to say about that is we're this is an active area of analysis for us um, where where we're attempting to where we plan to in the next data release uh, share our connectivity data as the parameters from a Gaussian fit to the connection probabilities. And with that data release, that's the sort of, that's how I recommend you uh, set up your models by you know using the distance constant and the amplitude returned from the Gaussian fit for the connections of your int of interest to you. All right, so that's that's coming, and that's uh, something we're actively working on. And uh, we've done compared a lot of f fitting methods, and we've really feel much better now about the values we're returning using uh, the using the most current fitting methods. Okay, and then your second question about uh, is there anything interesting in the human data? So yes, there are a lot of interesting things. I would say a general observation is that the that the human connections could be described as being more robust. So often they're stronger. They often, if you sort of hit them, they they get stronger. So they tend to um, often facilitate with recovery. So they get, you know, you you induce the you induce short-term plasticity, you wait some amount of time, and when you look again, they're even stronger. So that's a, I would describe them as being uh, as as being uh, more robust. There's also some interesting uh, uh, circuit properties. So we're seeing um, a, uh, uh, between layer two and layer three, we're seeing these multi-synaptic inhibition often turns can be termed uh, lateral inhibition, but in this case, it's across layers. So we are recording from two excitatory cells and in layer, and what we see is an inhibitory response in the postsynaptic cell. So we interpret that as there being an interposed interneuron. And we see a number of those connections going from layer two to layer three, but not in the other direction. So that's another interesting feature of the data set. Cool. Uh, in the interest of time, Tim, would you mind, you do have another question in the ask a question panel. Um, if you can type the, the answer uh, by type uh, clicking comment. Uh, sure, definitely. Okay, thank you, Saskia. Great, thanks, Tim. That was thanks, great. Thanks, Tim. All right, so our next speaker now is going to be Nuno da Costa, who will be um, talking about uh, mapping the connectivity of cell types with EM connectomics. Um, he'll be describing some of the EM data that his team is generating um, and how he can integrate this high resolution data with other cell type uh, properties. So, welcome, Nuno. Thank you. Um, I think uh, my screen is shared. So... Perfect. Yeah. Um, 
thank you everyone for attending and thank you CNS for giving us this um, opportunity. My the next my presentation and the next are, are going to be on the, on the, uh, how we at the institute are, are mapping um, with high high resolution structural methods um, the 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 structure of the of the connectivity. And also, and also, and also of of of, of the cell types, um, and so it, it's it's kind of a, it's a it's a it's a very nice uh, kind of um, uh, kind of match with the two presentations that you've just heard before. And I'm gonna talk a bit about the the data, which is electron microscopy data, and then um, and then Forrest Coleman after me is gonna talk about gonna focus more how you can interact and use and abuse this 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 data set. Um, and um, and uh, and and though we are now producing uh, 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 independently a, a lot of this data at the institute, the data that I'm going to talk to you today um, it comes from a collaboration funded by the IARPA Microns project between uh, the the team of Andreas Tulias um, at Baylor College of Medicine, which um, which um, collect, uh, collected uh, a lot of functional data on the mice. We collected the EM on these mice and co-registered with the physiology. And here at the Institute, uh, the, the teams that have been most involved has been uh, uh, Clay team, which is the head of our department, my, my team, uh, Forrest Coleman team, and, of, and uh, our precious uh, program uh, man, uh, project management uh, done by uh, Shelby Suko. We also collaborated with um, Wei Shun Li at Harvard, uh, particularly on the, the methods for sectioning. And finally, uh, with Sebastian Soon, which from our data generated these beautiful automated segmentations of the, of the neurons that I'm going to show you. Um, and and, and these, are, these are the major questions that we were, that we are interested in. We were interested when we collected the data, what are the morphological and connectivity properties of cell types? Uh, what is the synaptic resolution graph of individual cortical area, and also what's the relationship between these two, this structure and the functional properties of the cells that we observed in vivo. But uh, as hopefully you'll see, there's much more to explore in these data sets that just the reason why you collected them, there's fine structure of organelles, there's all the there's there, there'll be measurement of the surface uh, membrane of each neuron, there'll be Glia, there'll be blood vessels, um, and um, and um, and much of what I've said is kind of automatic uh, segmented. And so I'm going to start maybe to by giving you um, uh, an idea of the raw data looks like, and and we're going to start at the kind of lower resolution, uh, lower um, lower mag of the data. So I'm, I'm going to guide you a bit. This is why it is a blood vessel. Here are nucleus, uh, somas with the nucleus. And as you zoom in, you can start to see better uh, dendrites. As you see here, they are the, the biggest process. And as you continue to zoom in, you see dendrites, but you start to see also smaller processes. These are, these are the axons. And as you see, every, every single part of, this, of, this, of these objects are here. And finally, as you continue to zoom in, you start seeing synapses. Here's, here's one, here's another. And, um, and, and as you continue to zoom in, you even start to see kind of vesicles. And uh, and um, and again, our and and now you see it in a single view. Now you see this in Z, and 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 we align these uh, single plane images so that we can so see later. We can extract the 3D uh, segmentation, the 3D reconstructions of, of 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 the neurons. And again, you can also see subcellular organelles like mitochondria. These are those dark things. And again. This is not, we are not originally interested in mitochondria, but if, if you are, this is something that, or in any other subcellular organelle, like the nucleus and so forth, all of these are available in this, in this, in this data. Um, so, so now I'm gonna tell you a bit about, um, just show you what the different data sets that we have collected so far. Uh, the smallest one, is it's, it's already public, and I'll show you where at the end of this talk. And, uh, and for a Coleman, we'll, we'll also, we'll also um, show you how you can access it. So in the mouse, we have collected so far four data sets. The first three were within the IARPA Microns program. And, uh, and the fourth, which is not yet segmented, but is collected, is, uh, is, is, um, is uh, the, the, the functional imaging was, was collected at the Institute. So I'll start with the first one. This is, we call it 
the small data set, we call it, we nickname is Pinky. Um, it has uh, 500 neurons with SOMA in the volume. It's about um, 150 microns by 200, 150 microns in the P at white matter direction, about 200 microns on the medial lateral direction. It has 500 neurons, and even though we call it the small data set, it does have 3 million synapses. Um, and and uh, uh, a, a lot of the data I've gone at, uh, uh, some of that I'm going to uh, share with you today is from this data set. So there's a, a second data set that is a bit, and it, oh, and the first data set is about 100 micron thick. Um, the, the, the second, the second uh, data set that we, we have, um, it's, it's now from PIA to the white matter. So it has neurons across all uh, columns. It's not public yet. Um, and it's a bit thinner, it's 40, 40 microns thick. It has about 4,000 neurons with SOMA in the volume. Uh, and about 40 million synapses. And again, um, um, one thing to point out in, in these data sets, it's the, even though there are 4,000 neurons, their arbor is not totally complete because since the, since the, the, the even the dendritic arbor will have uh, 150 microns of radius. And then there are the, the petascale millimeter cube data sets that start to contain kind of more complete arbors of neurons. And this is, this is a data set that, uh, that we are very excited to analyze exactly because of that. And we can look at a lot of the local properties of, uh, of connectivity and, and even connectivity between different areas at the electron mic, at, uh, at the synapse resolution. And so one of the, the, the first data set, we call it MINI, was collected under the ARPA Microns program is, is about a millimeter cube in size, so it goes from P to white matter, and it's and it's uh, and its location on the cortex here on top of the CCF that Lydia's talked to you about yesterday. It covers it covers uh, V1, it covers RL, it covers AL, and a bit of LM. Uh, currently, 65% uh, of this has been segmented, so um, it's still tens and tens of thousands of neurons uh, and hundreds of millions of synapses. And the second data set, uh, which, um, which the functional imaging was collected at the Institute, is not segmented yet, but lies at the core of, 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 of V1. So it, it, will, it will allow us to look at really at the local circuit of the, of the, of the primary visual cortex of the mouse. And we expect to have, uh, for, for many neurons, their complete local axonal and dendritic, dendritic arbor. Um, and again, um, yeah, we are, it's really, um, Kind of astronomic numbers of neurons and and and, and synapses. So I'm, I'm going to have just two slides to 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 tell you a bit of the process how we collect the, these these data sets. It um it has it uh, in a way we 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 love to be analyzing the data, but it's 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 uh, it's 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 good to to see the process that lead to there and. Uh, it, it is still nerve wracking to produce these data sets, but it's but it's uh, we are now collecting our third large data set in, in the human. So it's becoming it's uh, it's it's becoming more and more reproducible. And we expect that uh, you know in the in the future one can collect these over 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 areas over species and maybe even uh, developmental stages. Um, and it will be yeah. Feel free to write your feedback on the on on the areas that are of more interest to you in in the comments. Um, so how are these data sets collected? Uh, so they start by uh, functional imaging uh, in the very similar to the to the one you do here uh, tomorrow. Um, 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 in the, the data I'm going to show today, it was done in Baylor, but uh, again, in the new mouse was done at the Institute and with all the parameters kind of well aligned to what the, the brain observatory has, 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 uh, uh, has made uh, public in their data. Then there is the first nerve wracking step, which is the profusion of the mouse that has to be perfect or else everything starts from scratch again, because the, the quality of the ulcer structure is highly dependent on the profusion uh, and, and therefore the quality of the segmentation. Therein, then there is the blocking. We really want to take a block of the mouse brain that includes the region where we've done the, 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 the functional imaging. Again, again, kind of a tense moment and this has been Done by Mark Takeno in our in our team. Then there is histology. Um, um, again, um, sometimes a boring step, but again, essentially to, to for the quality of the final segmentation. And and here, um, Joanne Buchanan has been highly uh, has been kind of leading this step. 
Then we do a micro CT, um, very similar to what uh, Eva described yesterday, just to find out if we have in our piece of tissue the block that we imaged in vivo. Then resectioning. This is uh, where the team comes together for two weeks of 24-7 uh, 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 nerve wracking, where we, we cut 20,000 serial sections and we try to not lose uh, uh, two sections in a row, not always is, is possible, but uh, we managed to, to get 10 of, um, yeah, almost 20,000 sections with, uh, with very minimal loss, less than 1%. Then we do the imaging, which we touch in the next uh, step, then we, which we collect about more than 100 million individual tiles that then have to be stitched together first into, oh, and this is the, uh, Agnes Bodor and, uh, and uh, Dan Boombarger uh, led the sectioning, then uh, the imaging, which has been led by Wen, Wen Jing and um, Yin and uh, Derek Britton, and then to this teaching, when you bring this 100 million tiles uh, together in single planes, and then in 3D, and Gayatri Mahaligan and Russell Torres, and then Kepner have been leading this. And then, and then we start, or we moved it on to Sebastian team, and they start to extract from these from these images the beautiful segmentations that you see later. Is that it's then we can register it so we can assign the functional to the to the to the to the to the anatomy, and 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 finally we get to the visualization and um, and, and and analysis and 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 and, and here um, Forrest Coleman. Uh, um, Charmi, uh, Leila, Casey, all names that we've seen acknowledgements have been highly involved in creating both these and the analysis tools, but also uh, a lot of the team from Sebastian uh, uh, in Princeton has also worked heavily on, on, on this. Um, and so, and that's where we start seeing this beautiful neuron. So you see here a neuron from a, that small data set that I mentioned to you uh, uh, before. Um, it's, a, it's this case is an inhibitor, it's a basket cell. And even though that data set is small in this particular cell, where we have about 1,500 uh, output synapses here in red, and almost 5,000 input synapses onto this onto this neuron. Um, okay. And so, so I'm just going to touch one slide on how we collect the data um, because uh, it's a bit um, it's um, it's 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 a bit it's a bit different from from many of our from many of our colleagues. We we actually use very old microscopes. They are from the late uh, 70s, early 80s, and make a few transformations of them that transform these old but very reliable machines into some of the most uh, fast electron microscopes on the on the planet. And this was an idea that's originally developed by Clay Reed and David Bock uh, uh, when they were in Harvard. And so we take these GOL machines, these again, 40-year-old uh, um, machines into and we make two changes. One of them, we put them on stilts. If you ever develop analog photography, you know that if you wanted to have a big picture, you'll just move your negative away from your paper. And here our paper is a camera, and our negative is those sections that we have collected. And then, uh, and then, and then it allows us to take very large fields of EM. And then we have a very fast um, uh, sample holder that uh, that um, that uh, that that moves our sample, and that allows us to get. Uh, to get to collect uh, data rates at the level of 36 terabytes per day um, and the, uh, across our whole pipeline. And by doing this, we can, in using this kind of old but much cheaper machines, um, we can have not just one, but several of them. It's like a, a farm, in case we have six, that can image in parallel those large volumes, those petascale volumes, those um, millimeter cube volumes that have uh, tens of thousands of sections. So when you once, and, and here you see, an imaging of uh, five of those micro video, five of those microscopes imaging, imaging um, uh, kind of uh, simultaneously, and this is kind of real real time data collection. And each one of these images is about uh, uh, thirty microns uh, by thirty microns. So once you once you we collected all this this data, and then we we moved this better better scale data set to Sebastian, and we waited, and then we were kind of we kind of marvel when the result came in, and I hope you are as well. And what you see, we'll see in the next slide, is uh, some neuron segmentum from this data set. So what, so what you see for here in blue is a, an axon, a bit of an axon of a layer two three neuron. Um, and this blue axon is making a synapse with this spine 
on this other neuron in red, and as and then and then I'm and and all of this is automatic segmentation of that EM data that I just showed you. And as as I'm now going to zoom out a bit uh, in this beautiful video made by Forrest, and you see you can track the that blue axon back and back and back and back and back and back and back to its owner, which was this uh, layer two three neuron uh, in uh, in in RL, and 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 you see here not only that dendritic arbor with all of its spines, but also a subset of these targets in in RL here, but also in V one on this side, and so and so. Um, so no, no, you have about ten minutes. Uh, about ten, 10. minutes. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll move uh, fast now. Um, and so, and of course, together with this data comes comes a, physi a physiology data set. And I'm, I'm going to jump a bit over this because I, I'm not uh, I'm going to speak too much of the physiology. And and um, and then, of course, this data we we want to analyze their connectivity, but we want to make sure that it's well integrated with the, the rest of the the rest of the. Um, of the of the data at the institute that you have heard over the last day and a half, and for that, since we use, we can use morphology since in from our EM data we can we have morphology of neurons, and here's a another inhibitory cell from this large data set, and from as you've seen in the previous presentations, synaptic physiology uh, uh, and 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 Pat Schick, they also connect morphology, so we could so we can use morphology to link this to this to this to the our EM data to the um, to the to the to the to the all the other data at the institute includes synaptic physiology and and to show you an example of this can be done I'm gonna I'm gonna use one cell type this is the Shenley cell type and I'm gonna use it because it's an easy example to start uh, its morphology is very characteristic as in um, and its transcriptomic is very characteristic and its morphology is characteristic because it targets the action due to its connectivity also being very characteristic, it targets only the action initial segment of excitatory neurons in layer two, three. And again, here's a video of, uh, in gray are layer two, three pyramidal cells in V1. And this is their action initial segment. And now you can see here from the CM segmentation, one Shunli axon forming multiple synapses onto different cells. And you now see other Shunli axons forming other multiple sign and then, and, and so forth. Um, and again, from our EM data set, we can have this kind of complete contribution of a one of all of the synapses that one cell type forms with a particular particular target. And and um, from 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 this um, from this from 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 this, we know we not only know where the targets are, where the synapses are, but also we can build this connectivity matrix. In this case, in the y-axis is the different pyramidal cells, and in the x-axis is the different Shunli axons, and how many synapses they form with each one of them. And one interesting observation um, um, uh, that uh, that that comes out of this is that um, the Shunli cells have a huge variability of targeting, of uh, as you can see here in this graph. Some pyramidal cells uh, receive very few synapses from the Shunli synapse uh, axons, and others receive many more. And this is and this is a huge variability um, that's already hinted in older studies that is very different when you compare like the synapse to the soma where no pyramidal cell escapes somatic inhibition. And in our in our paper we ex we explore uh, different parameters from uh, for to that that uh, that this, that can explain this 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 kind of variability. But um, um, but one 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 important factor of this study is that the conclusions that we that we extract from it uh, that this uh, that the the Shunli cells um, uh, provide a, a global inhibitory signal that is individually adjusted to each neuron. As you can see, there are some neurons receive a lot, and some neurons receive very few. Would have been possible if we had not linked this to physiology, and we can link it to physiology because uh, because uh, um, as Basilic uh, mentioned yesterday, with the tools that we are building in terms of genetic mice, you can can we can have we can have mice that uh, that are that uh, where we can make the just the Shunli cells. Um, 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 uh, act, uh, measure the activity of, of the Shunli cells, and then relate the, the activity with the function. And here's some recordings by Jung Sang on different planes of the same miles of, of the Shunli cells. And one thing that you can see is that all the Shunli cells are active 
uh, kind of at the same time. So here are some somas uh, of cells, again, in different types. And you can see when they get active, they are all active together. So, um, and, uh, and, and, and now the question is, when are they active together? So, um, so on the, the right graph, you can see that the, the correlation of their activity is actually higher than any other cell type that we have, uh, that we have looked at. And here you can see their activity again very synchronized. And now on top of it, it's the it's the it's the running speed of the animal when this was being recorded and their pupil diameter. And again, you can see that the activity is highly correlated with the state. Um, and um, and so and so um, and 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 this, these are all kind of measurements of arousal. So we could go we could go we were able to go from this fine detailed morphology of the connectivity to kind of measurements of activity in vivo and. Um, and, and, and the relationship between the two. So as I go to the end, as I have very little time, uh, one might say the Chandelier is a very typical, uh, very easy example. And here I want to show you that's not the case. So here is the, you know, the clusters in color, the clusters of excitatory neurons from the student of Goens and, 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 and Sorensen. Um, and in black is the clusters coming from uh, from uh, from the morphology of REM uh, data set, and you can see that their morphology are kind of are are are, are kind of uh, uh, very qualitatively matching very well, and so and that allows us to go from for these other cell types, and I'll pick here the thick tufted layer five cell, um, go from go from the on the M side, go and get their connectivity. And you can see here the, the, the percentage of synapses that layer five thick of the cell form with other cell types. So they form 2% of their synapses with each other, 13% of their synapses with layer five IT. And very surprising to us, actually 75% or about two thirds of the synapses uh, are formed with inhibitory cells, despite most of the neurons around them are actually excitatory. And so through morphology, we can, we can get from the M part the connectivity, and then from the the patch seek the and, and and other methods the, the transcriptomics and synaptic physiology and so forth. And and here's an example for the same cells physiology connect collected by Tim. So uh, uh, finally, um, so as uh, as as we, as, uh, as I move towards the end, I want to tell that again that some of our Data is already uh, available online for you to explore, and Forrest will 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 uh, will go into more detail about this uh, after me. And also to stress that even though our initial interest was neurons and their connectivity, there's a lot more in this data than that. And here are a few examples of you know, a not proofread uh, uh, glial reconstructions of glial cells from our data. All different types, microglia, oligodendrocytes, precursor cells, oligodendrocytes themselves, astrocytes, and I leave you with a, a video of a, of a microglia uh, kind of embracing a neuron in our, in our in our data. So in purple is the microglia, in um, in, in yellow is our layer uh, layer two three pyramidal cell. So finally, I want to thank everyone that that helped uh, with these data sets, particularly our network anatomy team, but also all the other teams in the Institute and our, and our external collaborators and IARPA and uh, uh, NIH for funding um, our um, our cell type program leads at Lean and Onkui, um, special thanks to Clay Reed that started all this 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 whole kind of program on EM Connectomics and finally of course to to Mr. Paul Allen. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Nuno. That was um, really awesome. Um, if people want to um, post some questions, feel free to add them to the question box. Um, I guess, Nuno, while we wait for people to post questions, I will ask you, uh, I mean, you showed us, what was it, like almost 15, 16 steps of, of collecting the data all the way from, you know, the, the start to the, the data visualization. Um, I guess which of those? What are the like? What's been the greatest challenge in collecting and analyzing this data that like you had to solve? And was it like a, a biological or a technological problem, or was it a computational challenge? Um, what was the thing that maybe surprised you as being kind of the trickiest piece to to solve? Um, I think 
the, the thing that was mostly nerve wracking for us was the sectioning. That's that for sure. And it's also the most intense where the, all the team comes together, cutting, cutting this night and day. It's kind of very intense. Then the thing that I was surprised that went much better and faster than I thought was the imaging. The, I, I, I thought that once we had the data at the end in the segmentation will be kind of fast forward on analyzing and that has been and that has been kind of uh, for me the it it makes totally sense that it's the hardest now but it has been the, because it's it's really so large and and just the the the, 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 the we we cared a lot about creating the data uh, the, but um and 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 the, the challenge of analyzing this kind of large data sets it's, yeah yeah and the competition was to share all this data so everyone can, can, can do it. Great, thank you. All right, well, why don't we, we now have a break in our schedule. So the next talk um, will be forced, we'll start at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So the top of the hour for whatever your local time zone. Um, and we'll be um, asking some, we'll be talking about on, on kind of a continuation on this. Um, and so join us, come back in, in 30 minutes um, and we will hear that. Um, Nuno, I think there's a question in the window if you wanna put an answer in by text. Or I, why don't I just read it? We have a few minutes. Um, yeah, okay. I was wondering how the segmentation was performed. Was this done via deep learning? If so, is the train network or its architecture available to the public? Um, it, it was. It was um, it was performed by deep learning by the lab of Sebastian Soon. Um, I, I think all of it it's all of uh, it, it it is a train network on the on the on the on the on the on the data itself. But and but it's also the more data is accumulated, the better even across data sets, the better it will be. Um, I think it's all available by GitHub in the in the by, in the Princeton uh, Sebastian. Um, it's, I think the code is publicly uh, uh, available, yes. Great, thanks again. Um, and I'll see everybody back here in 29 minutes.
All right, why don't we get started? Um, welcome back from the break. Um, our next speaker is going to be Forrest Coleman, who's going to be continuing to talk about the EM um, data sets, describing what the Connectomics data set um, is composed of and how you can access and start utilizing um, the open source data set. Uh, so welcome, Forrest. Thanks, Saskia. Uh, so yeah, as Saskia mentioned, today I want to take a kind of deeper dive into really what Connectomics data is and what form it takes. Um, and then I'll give you some brief demonstrations of how you can use some of the analysis tools uh, on the publicly available data set. So first, at a high level, what, what is connectomics data? So I'm going to describe some things it is and some things that it is not. What it, what it is, as Nuna mentioned, is these really high resolution micrographs of subcellular structure uh, in the brain. Uh, we, it contains detailed morphological reconstructions of axons, dendrites, somas, uh, glial cells. It has dense maps of synapse locations and their sizes, and it has a variety of other annotations that can be put on the data, uh, either manually or in an automated fashion, uh, in order to provide some kind of context uh, for, for analysis. What connectomics data is not, uh, at least right now, particularly in the mouse brain, is a truly complete wiring diagram. And I'll get into the reasons why, but uh, particularly for the smaller data sets, uh, as Nunu mentioned, all of the axons and dendrites of individual neurons are not contained within within the volume, and 100% of the data has not been proofread. Uh, so you can't you you shouldn't think about it simply as a graph that I'm just going to download and start analyzing. Uh, that is that is truly complete. You have to you have to really think about the data and what limitations different data sets uh, have and what the state of the of the proofreading is. So uh, today I'm going to talk in detail about the, uh, the, the website that Nunu alluded to in the end of his talk, uh, microns.explorer.org, which is the website that was, uh, is jointly launched by our collaborators in the IRPA Microns project, uh, the Sung Lab at Princeton University and the Chileus Lab at the Baylor College of Medicine, along with the EM Connectomics Group from the Allen Institute for Brain Science. So if you go to the website, this is a, a view of the homepage. Um, and if you click on the data tab, you can go to the layer two, three page uh, for, the, for the page for the data set that is presently publicly available. Um, here's a nice visualization that was made uh, by Nico Gimetz from the Sung Lab that illustrates uh, a large number of bramble cells from the volume um, rendered in 3D. And if you want to dive straight into the data, you can just go to this URL, layer23.microns.explore.org, and you'll get uh, transported into a 3D visualization environment called NeuroGlancer. Uh, here's a screenshot of the NeuroGlancer view. On the left-hand side, you have um, it's configured right now to have a, a kind of 2D view of the individual EM slice, and you can see all the individual tiles that were stitched together to form this image. Uh, and then you can see in this in this view, it starts out with three pyramidal cells selected. You can see those uh, pyramidal cells in 3D on the right-hand side here. Um, and you see the cross sections of those cells that appear within this section are colored on the left-hand side. So in this 3D environment, you can, uh, you can visualize these cells, you can spin them around, you can double click on this left-hand side in anywhere within the volume and you'll see the segmentation that's available uh, for all of the objects that are there. Um, this viewer uh, was developed uh, by, first by Jeremy Maiton Shepard uh, in the Connectomics at Google group. Um, there's been many modifications made by community members, particularly members of the Sung Lab. Um, we recommend using Chrome or Firefox uh, to, to access it. And there's a large number of features that I don't have time to get into, but there are instructions on uh, back in the uh, tools section of this, of this website that tell you about how to use NeuroGlancer. And there's a nice question mark icon in the upper right that gives you uh, some more instructions about what keys and controls uh, do. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about, about the data set that's available on the website. So first, it's dimensions. So as uh, Nunu mentioned briefly, but I'll repeat here, it's about 250 microns by 150 microns by 100 microns. And uh, putting that in context within Cortex, uh, it's, a, it's a section of, of Cortex taken from um, the top of the data set. Uh, is taken right at the layer 1, layer 2, 3 border and descends 150 microns below that. Uh, and it takes it's about 250 microns across cortex, and then the sectioning uh, dimension uh, is about 100 100 microns. So 
um, that's a kind of view of the data set that what about what what is the actual data? How, what is it composed of? So I'm going to go through each of these four uh, components in, in more detail. But first, at a high level, we've got the we've got the EM images. Uh, then we have a dense voxel wise segmentation of all of those images. And that voxel wise segmentation could also can also be represented as a set of 3D meshes. We'll talk about what those meshes are. Uh, and then, of course, there are the synapses, which uh, are represented as spatial annotations, groups of points um, with the IDs that underneath uh, lie underneath those points. And I'll, and I'll talk about more of that in a bit. So first, the image really briefly. Nunu did a really nice job of uh, taking you through that zoomed in view of an EM. Uh, but to remind you, here's a kind of medium magnification picture of EM. And I've highlighted some of the major features, uh, such as here's a, a cell body. Here's the cytoplasm of that cell body. Here's the outline of a nucleus. Uh, here is an outline of another nucleus, which happens to be a glial cell. You can tell uh, in this case because it has a, a much darker appearance. And here are these. Uh, here's a cross section of a dendrite uh, coming through the volume. So we have all of these images that you can access, visualize. Um, and we'll talk about how you might do that in a, a little bit later. And then you have the uh, the segmentation. So the segmentation is often visualized like this, where each individual component, each axon, dendrite. Uh, cross-section in 2D, but of course this extends in 3D, is colored in with a different color. Um, this makes it easy to see where one object starts and another another ends. Of course, in reality, uh, this isn't represented uh, like a coloring book, um, but instead that the underlying data is a, is a set, is a kind of matrix in which the values of those matrix are the ID of the object. So each of these uh, objects doesn't get an RGB color, it gets actually a unique ID for example, this uh, cell here might have this very long uh, ID. There are, of course, uh, millions to billions of objects, depending upon the size of the object. Uh, so we have to have a, a very large ID space to cover all of them. And so you have this kind of 3D matrix with all of these uh, ID values in it. And that's one way to represent the segmentation result. Now, another way to represent the segmentation result is one that's kind of more specific to an individual ID. So if you take uh, all the voxels that are correspond to one of those IDs and you run a meshing algorithm over those voxels, you can create this kind of 3D surface that represents the cell, um, which of course is quite handy for visualization. That's what was visualized on the right-hand side of NeuroGlancer. Um, these meshes in our case are triangular meshes, so they're sets of vertices uh, which are connected together by groups of triangles. Um, so those vertices and their triangles form a kind of spatial graph, uh, which is useful for visualization. It's also very useful for doing analysis, uh, like you want to measure surface areas or uh, do topological analysis on the neuron. This kind of spatial graph allows you to calculate distances and, and um, chop the neuron up into different pieces and so on and so forth. One extra wrinkle we have is that it's not it's not a graph of purely uh, triangular faces. Sometimes we have disconnected portions of the meshes, uh, and those need to be connected together uh, with isolated edges. We sometimes we refer to these uh, isolated edges as link edges. So here's an example of a link edge uh, grouping together these two mesh components here. All right. So one of the first most basic questions you might have about the data set are, well, where are the cells with somas in the volume? And on the website, there's a table which uh, highlights uh, where all of those uh, cell body locations are. Here's, again, the 2D picture uh, overlaid with, uh, with spheres that represent um, where the, the cell bodies within this 2D picture are. Um, and here's the, a screenshot of the table. Uh, the table has a number of columns. In particular, it has a cell type column, as well as positions, uh, neuroglancer uh, coordinates, and the IDs that correspond to those cell types. So the cell types we have are excitatory, inhibitory, and uh, glial cells. So they're extremely coarse cell types, but nonetheless useful. Uh, here's a 3D visualization of the locations of those somas within the volume, again, color-coded with respect to whether the cell is excitatory, inhibitory, or a glial cell. And then, uh, that, so that's one kind of spatial annotation. Of course, the, maybe the most important kind of spatial annotation is a synapse. So a synapse um, contains a uh, three points. Uh, our, our synapse annotations have three points. The, the three points are a point which is located in the postsynaptic compartment. And the ID of, uh, of the object that's underneath that point is written down. So that's the postsynaptic cell. And then similarly, a, a presynaptic point, 
Uh, and then also a center point. The center point is located at the centroid of the synapse detection uh, and is most useful for, for localizing exactly where the synapse is, but isn't super clearly in either the pre or post synaptic side. So here's a kind of 2D view of an individual synapse. You can see that 2D view is reproduced here in 3D showing this axon synapsing onto this spine. So the, the synapse table contains a number of columns, um, some of which I alluded to. You, of course, have the IDs of the presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron, as well as a measure of the synapse size, uh, cleft voxels, which counts the number of voxels which were detected uh, in the automated segmentation uh, highlighted in this kind of region here. Um, so there's a, there's a, there was an automated convolutional neural network that was run over the data and detected all of the synapses. So the, the total volume of voxels that were detected by the algorithm is, is quantified uh, in that column. And then there are positions expressed in X, Y, and Z in nanometers and voxels for each of these three points uh, that you can use. And this uh, table that's available on the website has 3.2 million rows because it represents all of the synapses that were detected uh, in the data set. So if you mash up these uh, two tables together, you can uh, create a, uh, a matrix. So here's an example of, of one of the, the matrices. Uh, sorry, I'm just taking a look at the time. Okay, so the, this, this matrix contains the presynaptic neuron uh, on, on, as row, or sorry, presynaptic neuron as columns, postsynaptic neuron as, as rows, and reflects only the cells with cell bodies in the volume. It's important to note this because Really, those are the cells in which uh, proofreading has been done uh, exhaustively. There are, uh, I, I think, um, I can't remember the precise number. There, there is a very large number of total objects, and, and many of those objects have not been undergone any number of proofreading, uh, any amount of proofreading. They have uh, quite, ex they, some of them have quite extensive uh, reconstructions uh, and, and are quite accurate, um, but they can't, they haven't all been verified. So. The cells with cell bodies in the volume have been extensively proofread, and you can trust uh, this matrix up to a point. Um, up the point that you can't trust it is the fact that these cell, none of these cells are complete. So as Nunu was mentioning, this volume is too small. Uh, the entire dendritic or axonal arbor of any of these cells is, is not uh, present in the volume. Some of the cells have very little axon actually reconstructed because the axon leaves the volume quite quickly. And so it's not surprising that such a cell doesn't have any synapses from it uh, because there's no axon associated with it. And others have quite extensive axon. And that's why you see this vertical structure in this, in this matrix. So there's a lot of structure uh, in this matrix. There's a lot you can learn from a connectivity matrix, um, even when axons and dendrons are cut off, but you shouldn't blindly just think about it like a, like a complete uh, wiring diagram that you can just download and analyze without, without considering the spatial effects in the data set. All right, so now how, how do you really dive into the data? Well, first you can just uh, start looking at, at Neuroglancer, as I mentioned, uh, but maybe you wanna start analyzing uh, some of the data. Um, and to do that, we've set up notebooks very similar to the notebooks uh, that Tim described on um, Binder uh, at this GitHub repository, Allen Institute slash Microns Binder. And if you go to that website, um, you can, you'll see this launch Binder button. And when you click it, uh, Binder will spin up an environment with all of the packages pre-installed for you uh, and the data already downloaded so you can start clicking through some tutorials. So, we have a number of different notebooks uh, ready for you to analyze. Um, here's one, uh, one example notebook in which we're reading in uh, these different tables. Uh, you could use this to make the, the SOMA subgraph matrix that I showed you. Um, it, there are also tutorials that, that show you how to make kind of interactive uh, visualizations. So uh, briefly, this, this this, one of the tutorials takes you uh, through making uh, this dynamic scatter plot. This scatter plot reflects um, kind of one of the figures from one of the uh, preprints uh, that was led by uh, our colleagues uh, in, in the Sung Lab that looks at uh, binary and analog variation of synapses between the excitatory cells in this volume. And what this uh, figure uh, zooms in on are all of the connections between excitatory cells within the volume, which have exactly two connections, two synapses in that connection. So they're these two neurons are, are both connected in two locations with two synapses. And on the x-axis, you have the uh, size of the spine head uh, on, of, of, one, of one synapse versus the size of the, spin, of the spine head 
uh, of the larger synapse. And what you can see in this plot is there's kind of two clusters. And that's really one of the primary findings of this paper is that when you look at the EDE connections in layer two, three, they send, team to, tend to form these two uh, different uh, two different groups. But this, uh, this scatter plot is in fact a dynamic one. You can take this lasso tool and you can select sub points, sub parts of the data and then uh, click this link. And it's gonna take you into Neuroglancer with a set of annotations that allow you to browse exactly uh, those synapses involved in that connection. So this dual synapses layer has all the dual synapses we connect, we selected. And if we uh, select these options uh, to highlight the underlying segment IDs when we hit these bracket keys, um, you can light up uh, the pre and post synaptic cell for each of the synapses involved in the connection. So here you can see there are two synapses between these cells and they're quite both large. Here's another example between the uh, kind of tan and yellow cell, and a line connects the two examples so you can go find them easily. And you can see in this case, indeed, both of these synapses have very large spines on them. So this is just an example of uh, how you can use these tools uh, to uh, create uh, plots that produce summary uh, summaries of the data and then use those plots to dive back into the original data to really validate uh, and explore your findings. All right, so what other uh, tutorials do we have on the website? So we've got um, tutorials to help you, you know, find neurons. So for example, as a simple example, find neurons with the most synapses in and out of it and make uh, Neuroglancer links uh, and, and teach you about adding annotations to the data. There's a uh, tutorial that talks about downloading images and overlaying them with segmentation to make figures to illustrate um, various findings you might find in the data. Uh, there are uh, tutorials about calculating distances uh, between synapses along the mesh as an example about how you can use meshes to perform kind of topological analysis of the data. Uh, I mentioned the finding all the dual synapses connections example that I showed earlier uh, with these dynamic scatter plots. Uh, and then there are some tutorials uh, designed to do kind of advanced visualization techniques uh, using BTK. Those don't work on binder because they need to interact with your uh, graphics card uh, in a more intensive way. Um, but you can set up a local Python environment and, and make use of those tutorials as well. Okay, so in the last part of the talk, I wanna kind of describe uh, a brief uh, vignette about uh, what kinds of analysis you can do uh, on, this, on this data set. So in this image, uh, we've taken a subset of of the neurons in the data set which are inhibitory and which have enough axon or enough dendrite uh, to be able to classify them into some very rough cell type categories. Um, uh, for example, uh, we have uh, these three basket cells in blue, which can be distinguished by the fact that they tend to make synapses onto somas uh, in the volume. We have 12 bipolar cells, which are uh, identified by their classic kind of bipol bipolar uh, dendrite morphology. Uh, we have two chandelier cells that are uh, Nunu mentioned in, in his talk. These are uh, quite clear because they're axons, uh, synapse onto axon, exclusively onto axon initial segments of pyramidal cells. Um, we have one Martinotti cell, uh, which uh, has a very particular connectivity pattern uh, onto uh, distal tips of excitatory uh, dendrites. And then we have one cell that we believe is a neurogliform cell, uh, which I'll get into uh, a bit Later, it doesn't have very clear, uh, it has a very low density of very clear synapses with, uh, with postsynaptic densities because uh, it tends to make, uh, does neurotransmission via volume transmission. And there are 12 more uh, inhib inhibitory cells that uh, are not shown in this plot that, that we're uh, not making a strong claim about their cell type. And the analysis- I'm going to have 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, the analysis I'm showing you was done uh, in, in collaboration with, with Casey schneider mazel So, oops. So one, one thing uh, that you might want to calculate is, a, is, is just looking at the density of synapses onto these different kinds of inhibitory cells. So the plot on the left uh, quantifies that in one way. So on the x-axis, we now have distance uh, from the soma. Uh, and on the y-axis, there are the, the synapses per a micron of, of length uh, of dendrite that are, that are there. 
And then the different colors reflect the different cell types. Um, and you can see that different cell types have very different densities of synapses uh, and different profiles about how those synapses vary as you move away from the soma. So basket cells have the most synapses, uh, particularly close to the soma, and they tend to fall away. Um, the pyramidal cells here have a, this kind of characteristic curve uh, to them. Uh, other cells, uh, like the Martinotti cell, seems to have an increasing uh, density of synapses as you go farther away uh, from the soma. And uh, so that's one way you can look at synapse density. Uh, another way is actually to quantify it in terms of the synapses per uh, micron square of surface area. So because uh, a neuron's input resistance varies uh, with, the, with the, the amount of membrane, um, this might actually be a more useful normalization to do. And you can see, in fact, that uh, particularly the excitatory cells have a very flat distribution of synapses per micron square when they had a kind of curved distribution of synapses per micron, reflecting the fact that the, uh, the dendrites of these uh, pyramidal cells uh, taper. And it seems that they taper in a way in which maintains a very uniform synapses per micron square. Of course, they're much lower because the surface area is much higher uh, due to the, due to their spiny nature. Um, also, interestingly, you can see that the basket cell and the uh, chandelier cell, which had very different uh, densities per, uh, per micron, have very similar densities per micron square. Uh, and there seems to be these, these, uh, these two populations of interneurons, uh, these different populations of interneurons tend to collapse into sort of a more uniform uh, distribution, particularly closer to the soma. Uh, also, because if you quantify it per micron square, you can actually put the density of synapses on the soma in the same on the same plot, um, and you can see those vary as well across these across these different types. So um, this is all to say that there is really kind of characteristic differences in connectivity patterns, even kind of very gross connectivity patterns, as uh, we've described here across different cell types. Um, as maybe most dramatically expressed uh, if we look at a rendering of the neurogliiform cell here on the left hand side, you can see uh, this neurogliiform cell we've plotted uh, all of its synapses onto, onto this neuron in green with balls uh, who, whose size scales proportionally to the uh, to the size of the synapse uh, and then the outputs of these neurons are are in red uh, with uh, with little red balls as you can see there are very few red balls along this axon. Um, reflecting the fact that many of the sites of vesicle release are, are not, do not have clear postsynaptic densities on this neuron. Uh, you can also see the remarkable lack of synapses uh, in the somatic compartment of this neuron, even though it has many, many synapses on its dendritic components. Um, one way uh, you, can, you can see that in the previous plot that the density of synapses uh, on the soma per unit micron of this neurogliiform cell is in fact below uh, the density on pyramidal cells, where, where in general the inhibitory cells tend to have more synapses on their somatic region. So there are also very systematic differences in the synapse size distributions uh, in these different compartments. So this is one way, uh, both the density and the size, this is one way of summarizing that, where on the x-axis now we're plotting the 25th percentile uh, dendritic synapse size, uh, and on the y-axis we're quantifying the density of synapses per uh, micron square area. Um, and each dot represents a cell, uh, and the different cells are colored with respect to their cell type. You can see the remarkable consistency in the density of synapses uh, and the size of synapses on the dendrite of excitatory neurons, and then the remarkable diversity uh, of uh, synapse sizes, synapse size distributions uh, in, in and synapse density distributions in the inhibitory cells, which are roughly characteristic of their cell type. Um, of course, the most diverse are the bipolar cells, of which you heard from Stacy earlier. They're uh, far from being a uniform population. This is a, a very diverse group of cells, and we've lumped them all here into a giant bucket. Uh, this diversity probably reflects the fact that there are many subtypes of bipolar VIP-like neurons that we are uh, not yet differentiating amongst in this, in this analysis. So uh, in, the, in the remaining time, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit more about uh, some of the resources that are, that are available. Um, so the MyBinder, uh, the examples that are shown on Micron's binder make use of a number of different tools that were developed as part of this collaboration. Um, here's a, a list of a few of them. 
Uh, Mesh Party is a, a package for doing mesh-based analysis and visualization. Um, Dash Data Frame uh, is a Python package that really that simplifies uh, taking a pandas data frame and making uh, Plotly Dash interactive scatter plots and other interactive plots like I showed you earlier. Uh, NGL UI is a Python package which simplifies taking pandas data frames and creating uh, Neuroglancer links. Uh, that's really uh, used in conjunction with Dash data frame in, in, in making those dynamic scatter plots. Uh, these are the examples. Uh, there's also Cloud Volume, which is a, a Python package written by uh, Will Silversmith from the Sung Lab, which is uh, a one-stop uh, location to download and upload images, segmentations, meshes, and skeletons, uh, both from uh, local disk as well as cloud uh, locations. Uh, in the future, uh, we're hoping to add to this website uh, more larger data sets, like the ones that uh, Nunu mentioned, uh, mitochondrial segmentations, nucleus segmentations, uh, the functional data, so you can analyze the connectivity in, in the context of the functional response of the cells, as well as skeleton representations of, of neurons that are maybe simpler for some uh, to work with. And uh, finally, I'd like to, to thank uh, all our collaborators. As Nunu mentioned, this process is, uh, of creating these data is very multifaceted, involves a very large team of te people working across multiple institutions, uh, both within the institute uh, and, and with our colleagues at, at Baylor and, and Princeton. And uh, I feel uh, quite grateful that I get to work with this amazing data and that all of these people work so hard uh, to produce it. So uh, I'd also uh, like to thank uh, our founder, Paul Allen, um, for his vision in supporting this work. And of course, everyone uh, at the Allen Institute. Great, thank you, Forrest. That was really wonderful. Um, I will give people a, a few minutes to um, pose some questions. Um, one thing I, you, you mentioned early on that, um, right, like that the, the connectivity is, is incomplete in these data sets and that that's something that you kind of have to keep in mind when you're working with it. Are there informed ways to extrapolate from this or is it really something that you, you can't do at this time? Can you elaborate on extrapolate? Well, I mean, given that it's incomplete, can we make kind of informed conclusions about what we expect it will, what that would, you know, what the measurements would be if it were complete. Um, is that is that remotely possible or is it just yeah. not? I think there are some aspects, um, I mean, it's gonna vary by biology, but there are some aspects, yes, and some aspects, no. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are the, I think that the important thing to do is to, is to look at how what you're measuring is affected by, uh, what kind of spatial effects exist within the data set. So when you find a phenomenon um, which don't really vary as you uh, start artificially cutting the data, or uh, those are ones that, you're, that, that you can trust. Uh, and if you have done an analysis uh, but haven't really taken the spatial effects into account, uh, or you see that as you start uh, artificially making the volume a larger and larger, your answer changes quite rapidly. Um, those are things you probably, you, we probably can't trust at that at that length scale. So, um, you know, for example, when we were looked at the chandelier connectivity, we started out analyzing kind of patterns in the in the central kind of core of the data set, and then and then expanded out, uh, and we found very similar phenomenon. Uh, you know, there wasn't not much difference in in the picture of connectivity that we got from looking at that. Um, whereas, if you look at the say EDE connectivity graph. Once we started getting a, a certain size, things really dramatically change in, in yeah. what you can infer about the statistics. So I think it, it depends question to question, and you'd really have to analyze it in the context of that of that question. There isn't sure. a, a general answer. Let's see. Hmm. Oh, here's a question. Forrest, um, in the released volume, what is the probability of connection between excitatory cells? Is it consistent with what has been previously reported in the literature? Yeah, so I, I, it's it's about three percent um, is the is what is what is found within the data set. 
Now, as I mentioned, uh, some of those cells, and that's normalizing for you know, taking all cells that have a reasonable number of outputs uh, as, as the kind of you know, presynaptic cell population and then and the cells that have a reasonable number of output of inputs is the kind of postsynaptic and just you know, finding the total number of connections divided by the product of those two, those two numbers. Um, but that's a very rough way to look at connection probability. That's maybe the way that you would imagine it if you thought you, you know, virtually sect, you know, patch pipetted onto all of these cells. Um, but we know that the axons and dendrites are cut off. So that's a lower bound on the total connectivity. Um, it is roughly consist in the ballpark of consistent with what's found with, uh, with uh, electrodes. Uh, and of course, electrodes are cutting off dendrites and axons in a slightly different way. They, they're you know, at variable depths below the surface. You have a 300 micron slice. Um, so one of the analyses we're really looking forward to doing in the larger volume is starting to do kind of virtually sectioning and virtually sampling this connectivity in a way that's consistent with the way that people do electro electrophysiology so we can understand in a more quantitative, closer way how connect connectivity viewed through a functional lens and a structural lens really differ or, or are similar because we know that these kind of spatial constraints are having a strong effect in both cases. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, thank you. We will move now to our next speaker, uh, which is Anton Arkhipov, who is an associate investigator at the Allen Institute. Um, he's going to be talking about integrating some of these structural and functional data uh, into a multi-scale models of mouse primary visual cortex, um, where, yeah, developing these cor these models uh, in mouse v1 and kind of things that his team's been doing with this. So, welcome, Anton. Okay, thank you, Saskia. Okay, let me share my screen. All right, so do you hear my presentation and can you hear me all right? Hello? Yeah, everything's good. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks. Um, well, uh, it's great to be here. Um, thanks to all the attendees and all the speakers. Uh, it's an exciting event. And so um, we've heard a lot about uh, different types of data uh, that the Allen Institute has produced and uh, some analysis of those data. And uh, what I'm going to tell you is uh, another area of research um, where we are trying to integrate uh, a lot of those data systematically uh, into models, into biologically realistic uh, multi-scale models of, uh, uh, well, currently of mouse v1. So uh, before I dive into this, um, I should mention that uh, all of this modeling work is made possible by the development of software tools uh, that support it. And uh, I just uh, talked about those tools yesterday, actually, at uh, another workshop that goes on in parallel, uh, workshop W4, um, about uh, tools and resources for developing and sharing models. And uh, that has speakers from uh, all over the community, a lot of interesting tools. And we are part of that community. We also develop tools that support modeling work, and especially geared towards this uh, large scale and um, biologically realistic models that I'll be tell telling you about. Um, the tools that we have are publicly available online. So just like the models uh, that I'm going to present are available, uh, freely available. Uh, the tools are as well. So here on this uh, GitHub pages, you can download them. Uh, they are open source. You can modify them for your purposes as you like. And uh, the tools are the brain modeling toolkit, which is the software for building and simulating the models. And um, another one is the file format Sonata, uh, which is an efficient way of storing uh, model and simulation information and so that we can share it with the community between different labs. All right, now about the models themselves. So yeah, so yesterday and today we heard uh, very good talks about different types of data. and. Um, you know, it all starts from the building blocks, so different cells and cell types. 
and uh, we have um, Basilica and Tracing. We have a database uh, that contains information on uh, properties of such cells and cell types, morphological, electrophysiological, transcriptomic properties. Then there is the connectivity, everything uh, that we've heard today from Tim and Nuno and Forrest, uh, some really cool connectivity data, uh, really deep and detailed. And uh, something that we haven't heard yet in this workshop, but uh, this is uh, mostly going to be discussed tomorrow. Uh, there are also data on neurophysiology in vivo. So activity of neurons in vivo in awake behaving mice um, collected using calcium imaging or electrophysiology with the massive, uh, you know, large scale recordings using uh, neuropixels probes. So a lot of richness of the data, uh, a lot of detail, and uh, we, and uh, we hope also uh, other members of the community would like to take this data and put them together. You know, we, we, we want to not just describe, uh, not just analyze, which is of course extremely important, but also try to model and predict uh, what the brain circuits do and the mechanisms, uh, understand the mechanisms in these brain circuits based on those uh, hard won, extremely valuable data. So ultimately we want to develop this virtual cycle of experiments and modeling, where we use all these different data to build models, uh, run simulations, make predictions with our models, which then in turn drive future experimentation. And then, you know, it, it continues in a self-reinforcing loop. And of course that has been done in neuroscience and in other fields and uh, different, uh, you know, in different settings. Um, Perhaps it hasn't been done yet at this level of biological realism and detail that we are trying to do here, but uh, we should certainly try. And uh, that's uh, you know that, that's why it's so exciting to be surrounded by all this data uh, and this amazing experimentalists. And uh, the models, like I said, and simulations are freely available at this link. So everything that we do, just in the best traditions of the Allen Institutes, uh, is uh, is is made available. Okay, so I'm going to walk through the steps of model building. And uh, like I said, it all starts with the building blocks. So in the cell types database, uh, we have the information on the transcriptomic identity of cells, their electrophysiology and morphology. For model building this stage, we haven't used the transcriptomics yet, but uh, you know, for the next, uh, next stage, it would be fabulous to take advantage of the new data and new classification based on the triple modality uh, that Stacy mentioned, that patch seek data using transcriptomic electrophysiology and morphology data collected from individual cells, from the same cells. But um, at this point, we were using morphoelectric information, uh, which is already very valuable. And this figure, this figure shows um, uh, classification of morphoelectric cell types in mouse V1. Uh, so it's from this paper that we published last year. Um, so uh, we found here, uh, like Stacy described, 20 uh, types of excitatory morphoelectric types uh, in, uh, in mouse V1 and 26 morphoelectric types of inhibitory cells. Um, are we going to use all of these types to build our model? Well, the answer will depend a lot on whether we can actually identify those types with other modalities, because we also need to think about connectivity and we also need to think about um, activity of those cell types. And uh, at this point, the answer was not. Actually, also, uh, by the time, uh, you know, at the time that we were building our current model, which was about three years ago, these data were not fully available and the analysis was, was not fully complete. So um, for our current model that, that we have now, we are using instead 17 broader cell classes, which is basically an excitatory cell class in every layer, from layer two, three down to layer six. Uh, then three inhibitory classes in those layers, PV, SST, and VIP, and uh, uh, um, and single inhibitory class in layer one. But in terms of using this data, uh, we actually don't have to worry about classification of types too much because we do not develop models of individual cells or individual models for specific to represent a whole class. Instead, what we do, we develop models of individual cells, right? And we develop them, and it's not just my team, there are a few teams at Dallin Institute working on this. Um, 
develop models at multiple levels of resolution. So we have a couple of flavors of compartmental models, uh, biophysically detailed models with active dendrites or with passive dendrites where we only have uh, active conductances at the SOMA uh, for computational efficiency. And then point neuron models, generalized leak integrate and fire models. And these models are developed for individual cells. We have them for hundreds of cells now. Mm -hmm. And those hundreds of cells, uh, we can then sample from those cells as a library of models uh, to represent whatever definition of cell type or cell class we want. And that's what we've done for our model of V1. Okay, then connectivity. So uh, Forrest Nuno and team gave this uh, really exciting talks about the data uh, that's available and coming up uh, with electron microscopy data set and uh, uh, synaptic physiology data set. So a lot of complexity there, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, exciting details to include in models. And of course, what we want to do is to take those data and um, process them into such uh, matrices that describe the connectivity between cell types, the synaptic strands, the axonal delays, synaptic targeting of dendrites. And, uh, you know, and ultimately in the case of uh, electron microscopy, one can even um, think about an individual connectome, uh, where, uh, you know, connectivity between individual cells. But this is currently an uh, inspiration. Uh, what we had to do again a few years ago uh, was to use some of the uh, then available Allen Institute data, but also rely heavily on the literature. Uh, it contains some information, but it's not complete. It's not, um, it, there are a lot of diversity in terms of um, experimental conditions, even sometimes different species used for the analysis, different cortical areas. So, um, but what we did, we, uh, we performed uh, a very thorough survey of this literature. Uh, we were meticulous and uh, we accumulated all this information to the best of our knowledge into these matrices that were used to create the models. Um, what is shown here are the cell type uh, specific uh, connectivity, but actually on top of that, we also have, for example, dependence on the distance and then also dependence on the functional properties of the neurons. Uh, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. So, okay, so this is uh, this is the current state, but again, uh, in the future, as the next iteration of the models, we really want to do the justice to the data that are available now and use this amazing data sets. Okay, then another part of the model is that we are trying to do visual physiology here, in silico visual physiology and compare with in vivo visual physiology. And for that, we need a good representation of visual inputs into the model. And so uh, we, uh, we know that the major pathway to V1 uh, comes from the retina to the thalamus, to the uh, lateral nucleus or LGN of the thalamus, and then to V1. And we represent that whole pathway as a layer of filters. A layer of filters that operate in the visual space, and they process visual stimuli, movies, and turn them into uh, firing rates, time-dependent firing rates, that are then can be converted uh, to spikes and those spikes are used as inputs to our model of V1. Uh, the way how these different um, outputs, so, so, so this outputs represents basically the outputs of the LGN cells. There are 14 types of them, all fit to experimental recordings in vivo. There are about 17,000 of such LGN filters that provide inputs to over 200,000 of V1 uh, neurons in our model. And as I said, they can process arbitrary visual stimuli uh, because they operate in this visual space uh, as filters. And so now we can use any visual stimulus we like. Of course, it will take some computation to process it, but we can use the same stimulus as our experimental colleagues are using, uh, and that way compare apples to apples, the output of our model with experiments. And the important part to emphasize here also is that the way how these LGN filters are connected to V1 neurons was also very meticulously uh, uh, determined based on the best knowledge from the current literature. Uh, I should also mention that uh, most of this work has been done by uh, Yazan Bile uh, in my team. And uh, yeah, that was uh, a really big effort. All right, so uh, now uh, we put all the model together, you know, all the structure is there in place. And what do we do? Well, we, uh, we, we hit a run button uh, and we run a simulation and everything is great. 
no, <laughs> that's not how it works. Uh, we can hit the run button, but what uh, a lot of modelers know is that uh, what would happen typically in these cases is that uh, you would hit one of the two most common scenarios. Either you have too much inhibition in your model and it will just, you know, uh, you, you send some input, the model uh, produces a little bit of activity, then everything dies out. Or you have not enough uh, inhibition or not enough balance, and then your model becomes uh, engulfed in the uncontrolled activity. Uh, it may exhibit this epileptic like uh, bursts of activity when everything is active at the same time, and then all the neurons are silent also at the same time. So it doesn't really do any useful computation. And that's not how cortical circuits operate uh, normally in the brain. So one needs to find this uh, very narrow regime between those two extremes. Uh, and uh, that means that the model needs to be optimized. So we optimized our models. And frankly, that was the, the hardest, really the hardest part of the work. It took us almost a year to do this optimization. We couldn't find any automatic uh, algorithms for such optimization uh, that could handle the models of the size that we are dealing with. So we had to do it by hand. But we also use some very strict uh, criteria for optimization. So we used a very small training set to do optimization, uh, basically just half a second of spontaneous activity and half a second of a single trial of a drifting grating. And we looked only at two, uh, at two metrics from those uh, simulations, just the spontaneous firing rate and the mean, mean peak rate in response to a grating. Um, for each cell type and compare that to the available experimental recordings for those same metrics. So that's what we were trying to match. Uh, and to match that, we varied the synaptic weights. Uh, we also tried to be very careful in that. We were only varying the uh, weights for a type of connection uh, by a multiplicative factor. And the synaptic weights had to be constrained uh, mostly within the limits that were available from the experiment. So it took a lot of work. There were many false starts, but eventually we converged on something that worked. And I just want to illustrate uh, the approach because we basically couldn't um, couldn't optimize the whole model at once. So we had to uh, do this piecemeal approach where we start inside here because uh, the, the approach that ended up working uh, illustrate somehow that there's this sort of canonical circuit architecture. And so <clears throat> we start with the layer four, which is the major input layer in, in the sensory cortex. Um, and so, you know, we first optimize the weights within layer four, and we try to match this, uh, this peak firing rates that I mentioned here, shown in black. Uh, so then once the layer four is set, uh, we add layer to three. And it uh, turns out that after that, we actually don't have to touch layer for too much. We still have to tweak it a little bit, but at least not within uh, too, too large of a range. Uh, so we can concentrate on layer to three and connections between layer to three and layer four. Once that is set, we go to layer five, layer six, eventually layer one. And so this is now a fully optimized model. Uh, and that's what we work with. So it's a very laborious process. Uh, and. Uh, you know, we hope that in the future, the, the automatic optimization methods that, that people are working on uh, will allow us to do it automatically. Uh, but currently, we had to do it by hand. But now it's done, and uh, you can use the models. Um, you know, we did the optimization, so you don't have to. All right. And so these are final models. Uh, they basically represent uh, most of the area of mouse V1, um, uh, more than 1.5 millimeter uh, in diameter. They span all layers from layer one down to layer six. Uh, there is the biophysically detailed version. There is also a point neuron version with a one-to-one -one correspondence between every single neuron and every single connection there. Uh, over 230,000 cells in total and 17 cell classes, as I mentioned. Uh, the models are freely available. Of course, the biophysically detailed version takes uh, you know, a lot of computational effort and, and about one hour to get one simulated second. But the point neuron version is certainly accessible to most of the labs where you can run a simulation on a single CPU with one simulated second in about seconds. Anton, you have 10 minutes. All right, thanks. 
Um, okay, and so now to finish, uh, just I uh, want to show a few examples of what we do. So we publish this paper uh, where uh, a lot of this is described in detail. Uh, but the key point here is that we didn't build this model to try and understand just one single question. We want this model to be multi-purpose, and because of that, we looked at comparing with many, many different metrics and different visual stimuli from the experiment. So this example shows comparison with um, drifting gratings, uh, looking at the di direction selectivity index. Uh, so for different cell types and different layers, one can uh, uh, get the distributions of direction selectivity index for the experiment in gray, for the biophysical model in blue, and for the uh, point neuron model in orange. And as you can see, for this metric, the agreement is pretty good. Not perfect, but pretty good with the experiment. And so we looked at these different metrics for different drifting gratings, firing rates, orientation, direction, selectivity, uh, distribution of noise and signal correlations. We looked at full field flashes, found good correspondence with firing rates and uh, signal correlations, but uh, the model is relatively slow compared to the experiment uh, in terms of time to peak and latency. Uh, natural movies uh, showed a good agreement for correlation of signal and noise correlations, but weaker, sparser firing. So these, these are useful, uh, useful observations that you know, point us towards avenues for improvement in the future. And then we also made some predictions, which have to do with like to like connectivity. So it's logic connectivity depending mm -hmm. not just on the cell type, but on the functional properties of cells. So for example, like to like connectivity is when two neurons prefer the same type of stimulus, they are stronger connected than the two neurons that prefer orthogonal stimuli, right? So we found this to be very important, especially for SST and VIP cell types. Uh, we found this type of um, connectivity pattern to be very useful for our model, where most of the excitatory inputs to excitatory neurons come from a stripe in a visual field, which is perpendicular to the neuron's preferred direction. And at the same time, something like this was observed uh, experimentally in uh, Herandini and Harris labs. Uh, we found some connectivity bias was necessary uh, to account for non-uniform cortical magnification factor. Uh, basically, if you go in X on the cortical surface, a certain number of microns that corresponds to a certain number of degrees in the visual space. But then if you do that in Y, uh, that, that correspondence is a twofold different from X. And so it turns out that has to be accounted for in connectivity. So all of this is described in the paper. Uh, I'll just want to mention a couple other examples of the work beyond this. And we, we have we have multiple collaborations now where we are using these models for many different things. And basically, what I want to say is that these are versatile models. They, uh, they 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 combine a lot of different types of data, and I think they can be used as platform for uh, you know doing a lot of interesting work, testing theories, trying different things. So just a couple of examples. One is perturbations. So. Uh, this is, of course, uh, a wonderful tool if you can do it experimentally. Now in simulation, we have a lot of exquisite control over perturbations. So these are just examples where a simulation without perturbation is run. Then we can silence all excited neurons on layer six or activate them. If we do that with a stronger and stronger perturbation, we see, so this is uh, of the genetic modulation index, which shows that the activity goes up when it's positive or down when it's negative. It shows that if you excite layer 6 excitatory neurons, then they and layer 6 PV neurons, their activity go up. But that actually is inhibitory to layer 4. If you excite layer 6 PV interneurons, that inhibits both layer 6 and layer 4. And this is just a good uh, test because turns out this is exactly what happens in reality. It's a bit of a you know, paradoxical effect, but it does happen in reality as based on this paper from Sean Olsen and Massimo Scanciani and others. And so this is a good proof of principle that our models can, can uh, capture something like that. But then now we can do it for every single cell type and we can do it for all neurons or for just one neurons, for 10 neurons, whatever. And um, so together with Stefan Michalas and Bin Juan Tsai, uh, who also participated in all the work that I uh, told you uh, until now. Uh, we also have now this bioarchive paper where are some interesting predictions uh, proposed uh, based on, on, on this type of work. 
Uh, finally, um, Galta Einewall is collaborating with us too, and uh, he's going to talk next after me, uh, but just a brief, uh, brief word here. These models do not only give you information about uh, firing rates, they can also uh, allow you to compute things like electric field. So you can get local field potentials and current source densities and compare between the model and experiments and then you know ask whether the model reproduces that part of um, observations or you know physical properties and how it should be changed maybe to capture those properties better so with that i'll stop uh, basically uh, my main point is that there are a lot of amazing data at the allen institute we are integrating them into the models uh, we've done models of single cells and of a single cortical area I hope that in the future we or the community or together will be able to go to models of full mouse brain and then who knows down the road maybe uh, brains of primates and even humans. Um, so um, this is an exciting times and I also want to invite everyone to um, participate in this workshop that we organize a month from now uh, where I will be talking exactly about this, the multipurpose models of cortical circuits and how they can rely on the amazing data that are now being available, being made available. Okay, so with that, I'll uh, thank our founder for creating this amazing space and all the amazing people working with us. And I can take some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Anton. That was great. Um, so there's a question here. Um, uh, you use different neuronal models. Are there some cell types where simpler neuronal models are sufficient to capture all the required properties, while other cell types require more sophisticated models? So we don't know. <laughs> Basically, that's the answer. I think this 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 is an interesting question. Um, we looked at the comparison between the biophysically detailed and the uh, point neuron models uh, but both of those models have you know the same number of neurons the same number of types and they turned out to perform pretty well both of them on firing rate properties although there are indications that for some other properties maybe you still need a biophysical uh, models um, we looked a little bit into that um, so for example the amount of cortical amplification of the excitatory current uh, was better captured by biophysical models but it's possible that that uh, point neuron models still can still can capture that if you optimize them further so but but then i think uh, that question is, is more about well if we simplify the model further if we maybe we like bunch together some of the types some of the cell types uh, would we still be able to reproduce uh, the observations as well as we could with all the cell types. And that's just something we haven't done. I think probably yes for some uh, metrics and probably not for others. And the real question is what these other metrics are. And um, you know that, that that's really a, a big question. What is the role of cell types? Where they matter, where do they do not? Uh, here's a question from Alice Geminiani, um, thanks for the great talk. I have two questions. First, are there any experiments you were not able to reproduce correctly? If any, what is missing in the model to be able to re reproduce those ones? And second, are you going to embed or investigate um, plasticity mechanisms? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, right, we do not have plasticity mechanisms now. Um, uh, so, Stefan Michalas, who, who um, who spoke yesterday and who uh, who we are working together, our two teams are working together on, on uh, many aspects of this. Uh, in his team, uh, he looked a little bit at the plasticity, um, but we, you know, we, we haven't uh, we haven't uh, made uh, a lot of progress on that yet. We hope to. We hope to, especially given all the amazing data that Tim was talking today about, where the plasticity is very well characterized. Um, so now the first question, um, well, we didn't find the case where the model was completely wrong. We found uh, a number of cases where the model wasn't quite right. 
So it's a, it's a matter of uh, of uh, quantity rather than quality for the things we check. But I'm sure I'm sure there are things that that this model just simply does not reproduce. We, we you know couldn't possibly sample everything. So that's why I say community, please take the model, try to break it in all possible ways. I'm sure you will find something where it will be wrong. One example I can give you is exactly uh, has to do with this electric field computations. We found that uh, the model reproduce the current source density patterns. Uh, like it, the, the, the comparison with the experiment wasn't horrible, but it wasn't great. And together with Delta and Evolve, we've been working on improving that. And uh, we found ways to improve it. Uh, one key aspect of it was uh, had to do actually with the model of LGN inputs, because it's great to have the filter models of LGN inputs, but they miss a lot of the dynamics in, in the LGN too. And so, there are certainly ways to improve it. And it's just one example. Great. Um, one quick last question um, from Forrest. Can you elaborate on what are the differences in like-to-like -like connectivity rules of somatostatin versus VIP neurons in the model? So um, for the somatostatin and VIP neurons in the model, actually those rules were similar. They weren't different, uh, and uh, they were, in general, those like-to-like -like connectivity rules that we ended up using. They were similar across a lot of uh, different neuron types. Uh, in our model, basically, the the major difference was um, the cell types level connectivity between you know VIP and SST and PV interneurons, and on top of that, there was this like-to-like -like, um, connectivity or synaptic strength. Uh, that was pretty similar to all of them and that worked in our hands but i wouldn't claim that that's how it really is i suspect it's not most likely it's not it, we just didn't have the data to really uh, make it more uh, uh, more intricate than that great thanks again thank anton you. for a great talk thank you uh, we will move now to our last speaker for today, which is um, it was Gauta Einavol. Um, he's at the University of Oslo and Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Um, he's originally a physicist and has been doing research on biologically realistic modeling, investigating spiking dynamics and electric fields in cortical circuits. So welcome, Gauta. Thank you. Do I have to do something? I, I think so. Hi, Gata. Um, do you have an option to turn on your video or start screen sharing? Uh, so let's see. Where do we, where is that? I only um, see Sashka. Oh, there I see my own. There, okay. Now <laughs> I can start share screen. Okay, great. Uh, maybe now. And there should be a drop down for which window maybe. to share. Yeah. Oh, let's see your entire screen. Yes. Maybe. Share. Okay. So what okay. now? Maybe if I sort of go. There uh, we go. Let's see. So now. And. So now, can you see the? Perfect. Okay. So then I just start. Uh, so for, first, uh, thanks, uh, thank you, thank the organizers for inviting me to to talk in this very very interesting workshop. I'm not paid by 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 Allen Institute, but I still think I would give my acknowledgments to Paul Allen to begin with. Uh, I think if I was extremely rich, I would do something like like he did in making this uh, Allen Institute of Brain Science, which I think is doing extremely important work. But I thought. Uh, I mean, I've been collaborating with uh, with Anton and and others at Allen for some time. So I thought maybe we should start with uh, why we work so hard on this, trying to make this what's called physical models. Because if we go back to Mars, uh, like famous three levels of understanding with the brain, he talked about like three levels: the computational, algorithmic, and physical levels. So the computational is more about sort of like how the say a mouse what strategy it uses to, to uh, recognize things. And the, the algorithmic is more specific how, what kind of algorithms are used to implement this computation. And then the third level is sort of 
what are the neurons and neural circuits that implements this, this algorithm? And I think when it comes to the computational level, there's several theories. I mean, you have like, for at least for, say for cortex, you have efficient coding, predictive coding, like maybe the traditional way of pooling feed forward filters. There's a V1 saliency theory and thousand brains theory. And there's all these books and some of these about this and some of these theories go many, many decades back. And I think it's, it's, it's very difficult to establish uh, which one, if any, of these possible theories or computational schemes are used uh, in the brains. And so it's difficult to make progress. And there's also some theories that at the algorithmic level, uh, for example, this, I mean, in the, within the computational theory of pooling of feed forward filters, uh, we have one of these, maybe this most well-known algorithmic theory uh, and like software uh, called HMAX uh, or yeah, HMAX, uh, which is based essentially on, on pooling of these filters and choosing them in a certain way so that you get this translation invariance and, and size invariance in, in recognizing and uh, like say faces. Uh, um, however, the, if you look at experimental studies at the, at the level at insistence neuroscience, they have focused on more on neural representations. I mean, the, the most important notion here is receptive fields going all the way back to Jubel and Wiesel and even Kufler before that, uh, where they found all these different uh, neurons which uh, respond to different aspects of a stimuli. It represents different aspects of a stimuli and you have made all these different found these cells with circular receptive fields, orientation selective receptive fields and so on. And this has sort of, after you blood Wiesel, this has really been uh, like expanded to the whole, the whole brain. So for example, I just got this compilation from Yuri Bushaki about different kinds of cells that has been named. And I think most of them are actually from the hippocampal formation. So there's all these neural representation cells, uh, which has been found, uh, but it's sort of a little bit difficult to, they have maybe inspired some of these algorithmic models and computational models, but it, the link is not very, very clear. So I think if you sort of go, a problem really has been, say, if you want to understand how mice recognize images, is really to make this connection between the algorithm, al al algorithmic level and the physical level. And that doesn't really exist. And I think it's, it will be very difficult to make sort of a, to, to distinguish between these different candidate models at the computational algorithmic levels uh, without making a connection to the physical level. I think sort of, uh, I mean, uh, eventually the, the whatever correct algorithmic uh, uh, model should be possible to implement in the, at the physical level with the neurons and connections uh, which are already there. So at the physical level, at the brain, I mean, we have all these, these scales, uh, but one thing which we're sort of blessed with is that we have a quite good understanding of how neurons work. At least we are able to make, starting with the work of Hodgkin and Huxley, we are able to make quite good sort of like biophysically detailed models of how neurons work. And however, from neurons and upwards to the circuit, uh, we are not doing so well, this is this is much uh, uh, much harder. And uh, actually, we wrote this paper, and, and in order to bridge this gap, and I think uh, a lot of the work that's been done, like Anton talked about, and has been done at, at uh, the Allen Institute, is really about trying to to bridge this gap, going from the neuron to the network uh, level. And we wrote this this more like perspective paper uh, last year about why, how we can bridge that gap, but it requires um, like large scale brain uh, simulations. And, and also you require like a really detailed, I mean like biophysics based models as starting points for, for these explorations. So, uh, so what we argued for here, uh, there is that for example, in the case of if you want to understand how like a, uh, like a column in a barrel cortex or maybe like the whole, whole barrel cortex. What we would like is, is sort of like a, 
um, a model actually at three levels of, of detail, not only the biophysically detailed level, which we Anton at level of, which Anton just talked about, but we also need models at the level of like more simplified sparking neurons and also population firing rates. Because one, one question has been, well, even if we're able to make this multi-purpose like biophysically detailed network model. What can you do with it? It's as complicated as a mouse itself, right? And, and that is true. On the other hand, it's like this ideal test animal where you can change all parameters at will and really use it as a starting point for uh, making more simpler models and even models at the level of population firing rates where you can actually get some physical or intuition about how it works. But the thing is, how do we find out whether these models are correct? Well, they have to be plausible to begin with. They have to be built, I mean, based on neurons, which we know are there and their properties. And then you also need to make predictions uh, with different things you can measure and not only spikes. I mean, most models so far has been, uh, been sort of validated or tested against spikes because that's something that comes directly out of the model, the, the, the action potentials or the firing rates. You also need connections with these other measurement modalities like uh, LFP or uh, EEG, MEG, and, and also optical modalities like calcium imaging uh, for that matter. So uh, this is sort of the, I think this is sort of uh, the, the kind of virtuous loop that uh, Anton talked about. And it's a little bit daunting. It's easy to make this diagram. Uh, and it's a little bit daunting because we know there's a lot of unknowns. It's very complicated models and a lot of unknowns and so on. But I think we should uh, take heart in, in, for example, the success of modern numerical weather prediction. Uh, because that's actually a complex system which bridged many scales, uh, like the brain. I mean, at least maybe five or six orders in, in, uh, in, uh, in length scales. And uh, this, the, the quality of this numerical weather prediction has uh, improved. Uh, I mean, it's gradually has been improved a lot over the, I think the first one, which actually uh, turned out to be useful came in the eighties, but now it's been steadily improving uh, because uh, I mean, uh, I said that, yeah, steadily improving essentially one day better into the future per decade, meaning that the accuracy of a prediction today or six days into the future is the same as in 2010 for five days into the future and this of course this has not been achieved by a single person or a single group this has really been a whole field of meteorology uh, which has been able to do this so that we now can get our like this very accurate weather forecast ever for everywhere in the world including oslo uh, on our our smartphones so I think this is sort of just tells something what is possible to do when you sort of able to have like have this very tight uh, collaboration between like experimentalists in this case all these people doing the, the the measurements and the people doing the modeling and of course a lot of statistical ticks and tricks and techniques that goes goes into this. So, and I think there is is that I mean the the traditional way of doing neuroscience is. Is uh, um, is really to maybe that like a yeah, one PI who has uh, like a, like so a little sort of satellite system of, of postdocs and, and PhD students and so on, and if you want to make uh, make these models and and also make the computing infrastructure to run them, you need a larger team. So this is like I'm involved in the Human Brain Project and of course the MindScope Project uh, uh, at Allen Institute is also an example of a, like one of these large scale uh, projects. And what has been really important at the MindScope project is, is that they have, uh, you have focused on, uh, on one particular uh, animal, uh, like the mouse. And so all experiments have been done on, uh, on like mice of the same type and same, the same age and so on. So in, in order to get the handle of the, like the, the variability. And of course you also have this brain project that Obama started like like seven, seven years ago or something. So, so how is the, what's what what is sort of like in principle the scheme for finding a physical model for say mouse V1 this uh, the system that Anton talked about? Well, first you need prior data 
to make the model, make what I can call a skeleton model, just where you put to get all the neurons and and uh, and the shapes and the types and also their morphologies and how they are connected and so on. And this has been done. I mean, a lot of talks in this workshop already has been about all this fantastic work that has been going on into making this what are called prior data. And based on that, you can make a, a skeleton model where you, which is parameterized by all these parameters, right? You have parameters for all these connection weights and, and, and positions and, 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 and neural models for that matter. So, uh, and then you want to go, you want to test this against, test the predictions from these models against experiment. And then you need a separate type of data. Uh, and in, in the case that we are talking about here, or I'm talking about here, it's really mainly electrophysiology. And there's also now, there's now this large data set, which came out of Allen, where you have these neuropixel probes. I think it's 60 mice, where you can get both the spikes and the local field potential. And with this data set, we can sort of decide on what should really be the brain signal target for the model. What, what aspect of the brain signals uh, should the model try to explain? And this is not a trivial, trivial question because, for example, what, what should be, I mean, if you look at these 60 mice, they're quite variable, of course, uh, in their spikes pattern and LFP. And so what should you try to, to explain? Like the average mouse or, or, or one mouse or, or and what aspect of the, should, is it more important to reproduce the spikes or the LFP? Anyway, so there's a lot of, of, of issues. And then, and then you also, in order to make contact, I mean, with these brain signals that is measured, you need to compute the brain signals. And that's a separate, separate thing. I mean, spikes comes typically out automatically, but uh, the other, other things like the local field potential or, or the EEG or the, maybe like what you would see in calcium imaging requires a separate kind of calculation. And then you need to compute the deviation uh, for this a metric that you have to decide yourself. And that's, this is not a metric that you can settle, uh, I mean, once and for all. This is something that one has to think about what, what aspect of the signal is most important to reproduce. And then you can say, well, is this, uh, compare this deviation with some kind of cr uh, criterion. And if the deviation is not as smaller than this criterion, you have to then adapt this large set of parameters and then re repeat this loop. So, of course, then you keep on doing this until you get a uh, yes and a fitted model, and then you declare victory, and at least uh, for, for a, a preliminary victory. And you can say that this is sort of like the best model or, or models, if the class of models, given the present data. Of course, now if you get uh, like a, there's now a new data in terms of both uh, synaptic physiology and, and EM. Uh, and anatomy coming from, from Allen. And then we can use this new prior data to, to start with like, make, get like a better start or get like a, get like a skeleton model to, to start this optimization. And then also new test data to, <coughs> to sort of to make, to modify the, the target for the model. But this is at least sort of a scheme uh, that is, and this is not, this is more like a, an ongoing program where you, but, but, but the key thing is that the, the best, your our best hypothesis for the model is then at all times is stored in these like best models uh, given these criteria. One important thing is that I just realized is that, uh, I mean, if you do model fitting, typically what you think about uh, model fitting is that you have maybe a model with, uh, with a model with the, that, that you have some fitness landscape is like this, this green wavy curve. And then you want to find the bottom. You want to optimize the system so that you get uh, get to the bottom, like the optimal model. And and this, uh, there's some issues here. You can get stuck in local minima and so on. And But then you end up with, typically with a unique optimal model, even though in, to find it, it, you can easily get stuck in local minima in the fitting program, in the fitting process. However, do you have 10 minutes. Okay. If you have models with many parameters, like the V1 circuit, 
then it's a very different kind of situation. Then the fitness landscape is, is, is much flatter at the bottom. And so typically when you start here or there, you end up, you always find a way down. And, uh, but they also end up with a, not with a unique optimal model. It's not one parameter set is that is clearly better than the others. So, um, and you, but the good thing is that you not easily get stuck in this local minima. And this has been speculated to be why the deep networks are working so well. I mean, if you have two identical convolutional neural networks trained on the same images, they will have similar performance, even though the parameters, the weights after training are different. So the, the goal is, is if you sort of want to fit sort of like a deep network, it's not the point is maybe just to find one of these uh, states at the bottom uh, of this fitness landscape, not one individual one. And I think that maybe is the same with the mouse. It's, it's, it's about trying to find uh, uh, like uh, one state which is sort of like comparable to, to, to uh, like one of these optimal states at the bottom of the fitness landscape. And maybe you can even think of like a fitness lens, uh, like a Turing test, that maybe a, a Turing test would be that if, if your model is, if you cannot distinguish the, 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 uh, the signals predicted from your model, with like from a group of experimental mice, then uh, then maybe this is as good as you can reasonably get. So I want to say and do a little bit of a, I started a podcast where we actually talk about this, this, uh, this thing with, uh, there was a podcast with uh, Terry Sanofsky and where we actually discuss this, this thing. And he, he had this interesting paper, the unreasonable effectiveness of deep learning and artificial intelligence that just came out. But one thing that we have worked a lot on is on computing brain signals. Because uh, there's many measurement modalities and not only, I mean, it is electrical modalities, uh, spikes, membrane potential, multi-unit activity, local field potential, and, and also optical modality, modalities. And it's, the key thing is that uh, these, all this, if you know, if you have say a model for a neuron, you can compute all this what, what sort of like an active neuron would pre predict or contribute to both in terms of spikes, LFP, MEG, and also optical uh, measures. So uh, that sort of like measurement physics is well understood. And we have worked on, on, on sort of uh, a lot on, on making tools for making this, this to facilitate this kind of brain signal computation, uh, particularly for this, this, uh, this electrical uh, measurements. And we have made this LFPi, which now came out in a new version last year. So it can now predict um, uh, predict all kinds of electrical signals. And these are not sort of the, the connections between activity and uh, the electrical, uh, like the sample, the local LFP is not always straightforward. For example, in this case, we see on the left here, this is a neuron that receives a one hertz oscillating input and we see you get this nice dipolar antenna. And this is, uh, <coughs> yeah. But if you do the same thing 100 times faster, you don't get the, the same dipole just 100 times faster. I mean, if you have 100 hertz input, you get a very different shape. And this is the reason actually why there's so much, the low frequencies are so much more easily seen in LFP and in the EEG. Even though there's like the firing reactivity uh, could be more quite similar at uh, I mean at the, at the circuit level, and now we have, we can also then if you have this say an activity in a cortical network we can then compute uh, not only the LFP but also the EEG and MEG. This is just an example of a 10,000 10, biophysically detailed neural models, uh, which then gets uh, like now it, it's moving in time. Now it gets synaptic input at the top. And then we get one pattern, both in the local field potential and the EEG. And if it's the same in input is spread all over, you get very little uh, uh, LFP and EEG, even though the, the spiking could just be as high. And if you drive it at the bottom, you get the opposite pattern for them when you drive it from the top. So this just illustrate how this, this the link between the brain signals and the firing activity is not always so easy to see. Here's another example where we actually computed from the, with a neuron, with a nest model, 
there you have to do a trick and uh, let's see. So there you have to do a trick and do this computer spiking in Nest, and then you have to replace all the point neurons with uh, biophysically detailed or like morphologically detailed neurons. But then you can compute not only the spikes, but also the LFP and, and also the EEG at the top of the head. So this is sort of standard, <coughs> standard um, like the forward model is quite well established. So then if you sort of do this, uh, if you have that, say, three candidate models, just like different network parameters, you can then, you get different spikes, different LFPs, power spectra, and so on. And then you can compare with experiments using some kind of metric and then decide what you think is closest. And then just to uh, end up with a, like in what, actually what, what Anton already talked about, we are now starting a, start a collaboration, trying to, 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 to uh, uh, like apply this program or run this program on, uh, on this Allen V uh, one model, where we in particular then focus on trying to uh, explain like the third spiking pattern and the LFP and, and CSD pattern at the same, at the same time. And I think I should actually have the same early example result as uh, Anton showed, so I don't have to, yeah, don't have to talk uh, with that again, talk about that again. But you see one thing, just if you sort of compare the CSD from this example simulation with the CSD from this example experiment, you have these questions, how, what, what metrics should you use to compare these things? And we just, we're looking at the different metrics and, and there's no simple answer, answer to that. Just want to finally add that we have um, started a collaboration on using these large scale models also in the context of psychiatry, because there's lots of information now about what kind of, what aspect of what ion channels and what genetic variants of ion channels may be like involved in, in like whether you get schizophrenia or not. And that is something which is, uh, and it's like not one ion channel, it's like a, it's like many, uh, many ion channels, many mechanisms, and which is very, makes it very different, difficult to, uh, to study in experimentally, but easier to study in models. Because this is something I've been missing personally in computational neuroscience. There has been sort of like a, sort of like a gap between genes and, and computational neuroscience, even though there's like obviously no revolution also going on in, in that subfield of biology. So that's what I plan to say. So uh, I just want to thank my, just like a, my collaborators who have worked on the modeling of extracellular uh, potentials. Hello. Yep, thank you very much. That was a great talk. Um, I will feel some, bring some questions up from the question box okay. um, if anybody has. Um, more, feel free to add them. Uh, but a question here from Nuno as, um, who asks, are there aspects of the connectivity or uh, any other portion of the physical level that will have, an have more impact onto the algorithmic level? Are there measurements, specific cell types, et cetera, that the models predict to be more relevant to perturb our current state of knowledge and that we should explore first experimentally? I think, the, the, the clearest uh, importance of, of actually these EM studies is that, um, I mean, that you can, which you actually showed in some of these, uh, actually some example simulations here, that the LFP you get out and the CSD you get out and the EEG you get out, sorry. The CSD you get out is very much dependent on where the synapses are, where, where on the dendrite. So you can sort of have like, a, if you have a, you can have a synapse a place on the soma and then move it up say to a like apical dendrite and you can adjust the synaptic weight so that the impact on the firing of this neuron is not changed much but uh, this lcsd and lfp will actually change sign so i think this is uh, this this em is is going to be very important for for finding out getting information about where this synaptic uh, synapses are placed because this is not something you see directly from like this paired physiological recordings where you measure the EPSP evoked by a, a presynaptic spike. Um, a second question is, um, do you think it's you know, more important to focus on improving models of single cortical areas to capture all of the details of spiking dynamics, LFPs, et cetera, 
or build larger models of multiple brain regions together or even the whole brain? Yeah, I think for the, this is something we have, we have been discussing in our collaboration with uh, with Anton is, is that clearly that the, there's obviously a lot of now that the present model uh, only has V1 in it, but there's obviously a lot of feedback going going into that. Uh, so and, and and this we don't really have a handle on. So so that's why it's you expect this V1 model maybe to be most um, most applicable for for understanding the first like the, the first volley of activity after you've shown a, a stimulus. So I think actually in, in for the the case of of the mouse it would be really great to have also my models for the uh, models for the other uh, other areas maybe first the visual areas but also the other areas and unfortunately these these neuropixel measurements which are already has already been made uh, actually covers many of these areas mm -hmm. great well um it looks like there are, are no more questions. So I think with that, we will wrap up. Um, thanks again for a great talk um, on some really nice work. Um, that was great. Um, and then that concludes um, our session for today. Um, we will have a, a, a session tomorrow um, running at the same, the same time um, that we can, uh, where we'll be hearing more about uh, more of the physiological types of data that we have, calcium imaging and neural pixel recordings. Um, so tune in tomorrow to hear those talks um, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Saskia, and thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>